warm welcome to the first live stream this weekend of the British Speed Lead and Para Climbing Championships. We are hosted here today by the British Mountaineering Council and GB Climbing. And this championship marked a welcome return to Edinburgh, the city that has previously hosted the IFSC Lead and Speed World Cup. This venue here, Raffo, is the largest and only climbing centre in the UK with an international standard competition walls for lead and speed. And we kick things off here with just that, speed climbing finals. I'm Mike Langley and I'll be guiding you through all the action this weekend and alongside me I'm very happy to have professional climber and University of Edinburgh sports scholar Hannah Smith. Hannah, thank you so much for joining me and it is nice to be back in a, a venue that's incredible in its own ways and familiar to you. Yes, absolutely. I trained here from a very young age, so it's great for me to be back. But it is, I have to say, a particularly hot day in Ratha, which may come as a surprise to many people. But yes, it's pretty warm and clammy in here today, but hopefully those conditions won't affect the climbers too much. So, speed climbing. We are just five or so minutes away from the start. That is the wall you can see in front of you. The red holds right in front of the screen. 15 metres of vertical climbing that does go down in just a matter of seconds. Climbers are secured from above, just out of shot there, and they race up standardised parallel routes. Obviously, the fastest climber wins. Competitors we will see racing in pairs on identical routes, one on the left and one on the right. And the winner is the first one to reach the top as quick as possible. And unless those sweaty conditions, Hannah, one climber gets knocked out. We will be seeing three categories racing tonight. We're going to start with the male juniors. Then we've got the female seniors, followed by the male senior categories. So there's a lot going on, and Hannah, there's quite a few decent climbers out there, some to look out for. Certainly. Um, in the senior male category last night for the qualification round, um, we had three of our men go under six seconds, which is huge. Um, Rafe Stokes set a new British record with 5.59, and Josh Brines and An Andrew Goodall, who is a local, um, also set under six second times, which is huge. Um, in the women's, we've also got Ava Hamilton, who's hoping for a sub-10 tonight, I imagine. Um, and in the youth category, we've got four climbers who are fairly new to speed climbing, so it should be very interesting racing. This is the British Championships, we mentioned that at the top of the show, but there does seem to be a pretty strong speed climbing scene here in Scotland. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd say, I'd go far as saying, actually, that Edinburgh is sort of the hub of speed climbing in the UK. Um, in about 2017, there was a Scottish speed squad set up specifically for athletes getting into speed climbing, and it certainly has increased participation up here. I think it suffered over lockdown, unfortunately, but there's certainly been some strong climbers spearheading that for the past few years, including Matthew Fall, who's in our senior male final, and a few of the sort of younger up-and-coming climbers like Andrew Goodall and Abel Hamilton, who we're hoping to see climb really well tonight, were a part of that group, which is really incredible, actually. Well, historically in Britain, the other disciplines of lead that we're going to see after the speed finals and Boulder that we have saw the British Championships earlier on in the summer held out in Sheffield. Speed climbing is kind of not the favourite discipline, but it does really seem to be ramping up, especially after the Paris, um, I'm looking forward to Paris, but the Tokyo Games back in 2021, where speed climbing was really kind of illuminated to the worldwide audience. And it does seem to have really ramped up as a sport because of that. No, absolutely. I think it's definitely increasing in popularity as the years go on and certainly its inclusion in the Olympic Games and us having a, a Brit in the Olympics, Sean Coxey as well, um, definitely increasing participation, but also the number of people that are really passionate about this sport and really want to see it excel. Well, a couple of climbers who will definitely be passionate about this one tonight. We will be starting with the male junior speed final. Four climbers in the male junior category will be in front of us first of all would be Alex Chris Janowski versus Robbie Gorn followed by Charlie Wardrop and Kenzie Allen just four climbers in that category followed by the eight in the female senior category and the eight in the men's so 15 meters 10 seconds to prepare themselves prepare the timing start pad at the bottom for their feet turn around to the crowd get clipped into the auto belay and it's going to be Alex on the left and Robbie on the right. Ready. Under starter's orders. Both climbers off, off really well, but it's definitely Alex on the left who's got the better start so far, but he also slips on the wall. Robbie trying to reel him in. A couple of mistakes from both climbers is making this one neck and neck, but it is 
Alex on the left hand side with 11.20 who will go through to the final definitely a little bit messy run from both climbers I'd say um, Alex will probably be a little bit disappointed with that run he's been running sort of 8 seconds usually recently um, certainly in last night's qualifier scored a little bit higher than that having one qualification uh, Robbie on the other hand last night didn't go sub 12 seconds so should be in theory quite happy with that yeah, just as you see the replay, like you said, uh, Hannah, it was a fairly messy run from both climbers. Clearly nerve showing out the first run of this British Championship final. Both guys looking nervous and opened the door for each other, but it was Alex who brought it home with that 11.20. Next climbers are out on the bottom wall. It's Charlie Wardrop on the left and Kenzie Allen on the right. Kenzie clearly with a better start there, but... Charlie instantly reeling me in. Charlie looking good through the middle of section of the route here and also maintaining that to the top a little bit. Stop start. Looks like Kenzie can't quite catch up with him. A good run in the end by Charlie Wardrop with 10.62. Great run by Charlie. That's actually his personal best. Um, he'll be really, really chuffed with that, especially in front of a home crowd. He's a local Edinburgh boy, so he'll be really pleased. And also our youngest competitor. Um, Kenzie, on the other hand, he got an 11.95, not a PB, and he did run faster in qualifiers yesterday, but still not a bad run by him at all. Well, we'll soon come to realise that the, it's speedy to climb up the wall, but it's also quick as we run through the different categories and the different climbers, because we will start now with the female senior quarterfinal round. Eight climbers in front of us now, looking to go down to the next two brackets into the semi-finals. Ava Hamilton now on the left and Ruth Hardy on the right. Ava with a big kick off the start, makes a good clean start, skips hold number four right at the beginning. Just struggling to maintain the momentum a little bit here, but this is looking better now for Ava. Ruth Hardy got a lot of work to do at this stage as Ava Hamilton approaches the top of the wall. Nice and casual, made sure she made no mistakes with 12.51. Yeah, that was a really good run from Ava, but nowhere near her personal best, actually, which is 8.84. So I imagine that was more of a sort of warm into the final run for her. Yeah, she, she, she did look like she was just kind of cruising there, making sure she didn't actually fall off the wall, because then obviously she would immediately be out of the run. Absolutely. And Ruth was only just off her personal best, so not a dedicated speed climber, but still an amazing run by her. Up next, it's going to be Pippa Watkin versus Savina Fillingham. The winner of this race will go and face Ava Hamilton, who we just saw. At this stage, it is knockout. Not about the time, it's about beating your opponent. Pippa on the left, Savina on the right. Better start from Savina, but it is close, but she does look better in the right-hand lane as it stands. Really good momentum up the wall at the moment from Savina feeling, and this is looking really good, but does stumble on the middle of the section. Really opens the door here for Pippa Watkins, neck and neck at the top. Oh, that was really close. That was a very close race. Savina, definitely a few mistakes there for her. She's a regular sub-10 runner, so um, I don't think she'll be particularly pleased with that, but she will be happy she's through to the next round. Yeah, uh, we're just seeing here straight away the nerves does seem to be playing a part in this championship already, all the sweaty conditions potentially. Definitely. I do wonder if the humidity is playing a part in these slips and um, slightly lower times, than, higher times, sorry, than people are used to. Next race, Louise Flockhart on the left and Emma Clark on the right. Ready. Fairly good clean start by both climbers in the left-hand lane. Louise Flockhart looking a little bit more relaxed on the route at the moment. Emma Clark got a little bit of work to do as Louise powers to the top of the wall with a good time, 11.17, quickest so far. Yeah, good run by Louise, I think. Um, Emma is struggling just a little bit, a few slips, she probably won't be particularly pleased. She's come all the way from Cambridge for this event. Um, but yeah, unfortunately just a bit of a, a messy run from her. Whereas Louise should be pretty happy with that. Uh, not far off her PB and she's not particularly a dedicated speed climber. She's actually in the semi-final of the lead event later on. Um, so yeah, I'm sure she'll be pretty happy to be through. Getting through is the most important thing, like we said, not necessarily the time. For Emma, an opportunity to go back, train, come back, build that experience on the speed wall. Next pair are out on the left-hand lane. It's Star Higu versus Law Renault. Ready. 
Star on the left, Law on the right. Great start from Star. Immediately off the start pad, but lots of big mistakes for Law Renault here as Star Hihugu powering up the wall with no issues at all at the moment. Great time, 11.42. Second quickest time of this quarterfinal round in the women's. No, really good run from Star. Again, I do wonder if she, being one of our more experienced climbers in this um, speed final, is just hoping to sort of get through to the other round without um, too many mistakes and maybe isn't running her fastest. Um, Laura, on the other hand, did also climb in our lead event earlier today, so maybe is just a little bit tired from that. But yeah, put in a really good effort. Yeah, you have to say it is quite hard when these these um, rounds go back to back. Obviously, a lot of hard lead climbing went down earlier. Then to enter the speed, potentially go back to lead afterwards, it's it's not easy. But it's now over to the men's category. This is the quarterfinal for the men's speed final here at the British Championships. Rafi Stokes on the left and Elliot Payne on the right. Neck and neck start, but Rafi Stokes absolutely blistering up the wall here. 5.59 was his best qualifying time. And just a couple of hundredths outside that superb start from the favourite, Rafi Stokes. Yeah, really impressive run by Rafe there, but yeah, nowhere near his PB actually. So that was him on a relaxed day, um, yeah. which is pretty impressive in itself. Yeah, really good work from Rafe. Real talent on the wall for British athletes to be going around that six second mark is absolutely excellent to see. Next bracket is going to be Matthew Fall on the left and Luke Turner on the right. Decent crowd building here. Anticipation for this next bracket. Matthew on the left. Luke on the right. Really great start from both climbers. Bit of a slip there from Matthew on the left. He's opened the door for Luke. Luke powers it through to the top. Real frustration there from Matthew in the left-hand lane. He big slip in the middle of the wall. And Luke Turner took it away. Yeah, I think Matthew will be really disappointed with that. His PB is better than Luke's. And I know that he's been really training for this event and trying to get sub-6. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, too many slips and Luke was there when Matthew wasn't. That is what it's all about, being there when the other athlete makes a mistake. Next run, Josh Brins on the left-hand lane and Leo Lamb on the right. Great start from both athletes, but it's definitely Josh who's got the head of, of Leo at the start there, but a big slip in the middle. It looked neck and neck for a second as both athletes made mistakes, but it was Josh who went through. Yeah, that was definitely a tight race. I think in this men's competition, there are climbers paired together that do have very similar personal bests, so those little slips do make the difference. Um, but yeah, good, good recovery from Josh there. Sometimes with speed climbing, it comes so thick and fast, it's hard to actually describe the middle section of the route. That's where we do seem to be seeing a lot of slips, especially on the left-hand lane. Let's see if that develops into a bit of a storyline as these finals progress. Final pairing of this men's quarterfinal. Andrew Goodall on the left. Kishan Fillingham on the right. A lot of movement off the start pad there from Andrew Goodall. Seems to be working for him, but this one is close at the moment, though. Kishian trying to, trying to reel him in, but 6.35 from Andrew Goodall. Good work. Absolutely amazing runs from both. Um, almost a PB for Kishan as well, so um, not his best climbing, but certainly not far off. Um, and Andrew will be happy to be through to the next round. Yeah, and all four climbers who have gone through to the semi-final there have gone in the six seconds, so nobody dipping under six but nobody more than 6.74. So good times there in the men's quarterfinal. We will be going back now to the women's semi-final. Ava Hamilton then on the left-hand line will be going against the winner, which was Pippa Watkins versus Savina. Savina went through that one with a 13.27. Ava potentially the favourite here with a quicker time in the previous round. Good start also by Ava and 
Oh, for a moment there, I thought there was a full start, but Savina Fillingham really stumbled at the bottom of the route, and Ava really now just needs to bring this one home to get herself through to the big final, which she does. Good running from both. Savina just missing that final pad. I do wonder if she had sort of almost given up by the time she got into the top. She saw Ava had finished, and unfortunately with speed climbing, once you've seen your other competitor finish, there really is nothing you can do, and I think that is the heartbreaking nature of speed climbing. You do see the other person running ahead of you and it's hard to catch up again. It's a pretty brutal sport, I have to say. <laughs> Some people say lead climbing's tough when you only get one attempt on the wall, but speed as a knockout round is absolutely savage. Let's see who comes out on the next rotation. Who's going to come out on top between Louise Flockhart and we have Star Ihigu. Louise on the left, Star on the right. Louise with a better start, but immediately Star powers through that lower section quite nicely neck and neck on the wall at the moment this is going to be a really close one now but Louise just seems to have accelerated that put the pressure on Star Star did fall and Louise Flockhart will go through to the big final yeah really unlucky for Star there just missing that hole to do wonder if she maybe got a bit distracted by Louise to her left um, with speed climbing more than the other disciplines you can see your competitor and as we just said that can make or break your climb a little bit and yes, Louise was right on her tail the whole way, um, so I wouldn't be surprised if that put a little bit of pressure on her. It really does seem to be almost impossible to avoid that peripheral vision of the climber next to you and sort of reacting to how they uh, perform on the speed route, and that seems to affect your, your climb. And we see a lot of mistakes when the person, especially on the left-hand lane, slips, it affects the climber on the right. Absolutely. I think that being able to directly compare yourself all the way up to your other competitor and having that mental um, strain only for a short period of time, but having to manage that during your run and also perform at your best is a really hard thing to navigate. Men's semi-final now. Rafe is out next versus Luke Turner. After these two semi-final runs, we will be back to the male juniors for their small finals. So it's Rafe, the favourite, with a 6.01 in his quarter-final race versus Luke Turner, 6.72. So this has the potential to be very close. Rafe on the left, Luke on the right. Big movement off the start from Luke. And from Rafe, but Rafe's powering up the wall, really showing his talent. 5.78 blistering and um, that is our first sub six run of this final really impressive from Rafe um, I think Rafe is almost in this position of power in this competition because he knows that his personal best is better than anyone else's so he knows that if he runs his potential he will outrun everyone else but does that not pile on the pressure on him as well he has to uh, different sports psychology for him to, to, to be the favorite it's certainly different. I think learning to win psychologically is very different to learning to compete with other climbers. Um, but Reef doesn't seem to be letting that get to him so far. Touch wood. No, absolutely. Really great speeds there. 5.78 for Rave. Quickest of the day so far. As Hannah was saying, 5.59 was his qualifying time last night. So he, in theory, can do a bit more on there as well. Next round, the final of these men's semi-finals. It's Josh Brins versus Andrew Goodall. Those guys are just having, as they see them waiting in the wings, ready to go. Andrew's a local favourite here. He is from Edinburgh, and him and his younger brother train here quite a lot regularly. Um, his younger brother trains lead as well, so it's a whole climbing family, and they're an absolute unit. And Andrew actually won gold at a European Youth Cup this year for speed so he's got a lot of success this year and I think he's been pretty excited for this event because he gets to compete with the seniors and test himself against people like Rafe um, so yeah I think he's been really looking forward to this event. Although all speed walls around the world are standardised do you feel like there's an advantage to having your home wall? I'm not sure to be honest certainly it must feel familiar the environment's the same um, and certainly this home crowd should be helping Andrew definitely because they've all got his back well, he's got Josh to beat. He's going to be on the left-hand lane now versus Andrew. This is for a place in the final. Ready. 
Both climbers really rocking off the start, neck and neck right away with a double slip, almost identical slips now, but Josh is powering to the top. Big slip at the bottom, but brings it home in a fairly reasonable time considering a 6.52 for Josh wins. Unfortunate for Andrew. Really, really good run by Josh. Um, really took advantage of Andrew slipping there. Um, Andrew showing some frustration just as he's coming down. I think he'll be gutted with that. But there again, he is so young. He's definitely got time. And he's improving dramatically as the months go on this year. So, yeah, I think there's definitely a lot more to come from him. And Josh can look forward to the final. When we see these replays, it's just fascinating in speed climbing how it almost seems impossible in a high-stakes competition like this not to have slips. Junior small final now. Robbie Gorn on the left and Kenzie Allen on the right. This is the small final, is what we call in this is, uh, speed climbing. This is the positions for third and fourth. So podium position available here. Robbie on the left, Kenzie on the right. Better start from Kenzie, but immediately slow off the start. One of these guys looking for a podium for the male juniors. Kenzie catching him up now. A little bit scrappy this one. Both climbers neck and neck at the top. And it is Kenzie Allen who finds himself on the podium. Unfortunate for Robbie this time round. Super close for both climbers there. Very exciting race. I think it's always um, keeping you on the edge of your seat right till the end when you don't know who's about to take it. And then you see one of the timers light up green and one light up red. That's the great thing about um, speed climbing. It is really obvious what's happening as well. It's neck and neck, and neck all the way up. Pretty simple format, this one, really. That raised 12 seconds to see who was going to go away with a podium position. Small final then for the female senior category. Savina on the left-hand lane and Star on the right. Really good start from Savina. Just slow and steady at the moment, but does make a slip and opens the door for Star here. Pretty close this one at the moment, neck and neck on the wall, but it is Savina who pulls away just slightly at the top. Wow, 300s in it, can't get much closer than that. It's going to be Savina Fillingham who goes away with that bronze medal. Very, very close race there. Kept, I thought Savina had it for sure, and then Star was gaining on her, but she just managed to take it at the end. Um, she'll be pretty happy with that, I imagine. So close. That's what we want to see in speed climbing. Neck and neck all the way up. You can immediately sense the reaction from the crowd here in the arena. Everyone just gets on the edge of their seats and you hear, you start to hear the crowd really pick up. Uh, certainly a lot of support for speed climbing in the arena tonight. Plenty of people turned out to watch and lots of cheering as the climbers are getting higher and higher on the wall. So with speed climbing, there is compulsory rest periods between the rounds. So this is what we're in at the moment. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's six minutes. So obviously, as the rounds go on, fewer and fewer climbers are in the competition. Therefore, they have slightly longer to rest. Well, and fair play to the organisers. You can see a bunch of them there on the left-hand side of your screen. There's three categories all running through different numbers of people in each round. It's a little bit of a, a bit of a minefield, this one, to get through speed climbing with uh, rotations so fast. We have had our small finals now in the male junior, female senior. We're going to be going for the small final in the men soon enough. That's possibly some of the young climbers you're talking about there, Hannah, who are starting to get into the speed climbing here in Edinburgh. No, absolutely. That's young Miles you can see on your screen there. Um, definitely a major supporter of some of these guys. And there is a really nice sense of community in here, certainly on the days at the weekends. Um, a lot of the speed climbers come in to train and you do see the younger climbers going up to the wall, sort of tentatively wanting to give it a go. And then some of the older ones will help them and teach them a little bit about it. And I think it's really nice. It's certainly um, a really supportive environment for newcomers and anyone that just wants to give it a try. It's interesting, actually, how many of these facilities are around the UK. The UK, as I was saying earlier on in the show, has not been the biggest speed climbing nation overall, but the number of facilities are starting to pick up slightly. 
No, certainly. Until a few years ago, Ratho was the only certified speed wall, I think. Um, now we have Warwick, and I was told actually by Rafe's mum earlier um, that there are five new speed climbing walls in the UK um, currently being developed. Um, so really exciting time for this really fast-growing uh, bracket of the sport. On to the men's small final then for a place on the podium. Luke Turner versus Andrew Goodall. Saw frustration from Andrew earlier. Can he redeem himself with a win here to get himself at least on the podium? Luke on the left, Andrew on the right. Really, really quick start from Andrew there. A lot of support, as you would expect here from Andrew. This is a really close run, really powering it home from Andrew Goodall. What a perfect race that was from him. Really well deserved third place. Oh, that was an amazing run from Andrew. I do wonder if he's managed to channel that anger from his slips in the previous round. He still looks disappointed, which is a real shame to see, um, because that was a really, really good run by him. Yeah, it's so hard to channel that energy into a perfect, perfected speed climbing run with so many slips, small footholds really in the grand scheme of things when you're passing them at that speed, as you can see on the replay. I say the standard of speed climbing here tonight has been absolutely superb. Male junior, the big final. Ready. Alex Krasanowski on the left, Charlie Wardrop on the right, and it's a full start in the left hand lane from Alex Krasanowski, which should be an immediate disqualification. Well, I think and he <laughs> knows it as well, he looks pretty gutted with himself. Charlie, on the other hand, <laughs> will be absolutely delighted. Yeah, as long as he doesn't fall off, because that would be uh, not a great place to be. But Charlie Wardrop is going to take this British Speed Championship. He's actually <laughs> powering up the wall and does fall off. Yeah, unlucky from Charlie there. Um, wonder if he just got a little bit overexcited with the emotions of the room at the moment. Um, but yeah. Uh, I'm actually a little bit stumped now. I've never seen that before with uh, a disqualification followed by a fall. Let's see what happens there. Will they get to rerun or not? Not often. I uh, don't understand all 150 pages of the speed rule book. <laughs> that one is a new one on me. We'll come back to that one. Doesn't look like they're going to get a rerun just now anyway as we move on to the big final of the senior women's. It's going to be Ava Hamilton with a 10.63 in the previous round versus Louise Flockhart, which is 10.60. So this one's really got the potential to be close based on their semi-final times. Ava on the left, Louise on the right. Slightly better start from Louise on the right-hand lane. Is very neck and neck at the moment. Absolutely identical, in fact, as they're powering through into the top third. Ava seems to be really close on the top third. But it is Louise who takes it right at the buzzer. 9.81 versus a 9.92. What a run that was. Yeah, both of them coming down laughing, which is really nice to see, actually. Um, still keeping the competition quite light-hearted and mostly about having a good time. But, yeah, really good run from Louise. I don't think she was expecting that based on her reaction. I think she was pretty happy. Um, Eva also maybe not expecting that. as She points at Louise as F to say, where did you pull that from? <laughs> that was a really hard one to call. It was all over the place there for a second as we go straight to the men's senior big final positions now for first or second. Rafe on the left and Josh on the right. Both were the top two male qualifiers, so this could be really exciting. This is for the British Speed Championship title. On the buzzers then, great start on the right-hand lane from both climbers, but it's Rafe who looks like he's going to take this one with a 5.62. Was it ever in doubt, Hannah? Superb performance from Rafe all the way through this round. Absolutely. Rafe's never really looked like he was lacking confidence throughout this whole final. Um, Josh was definitely on his tail throughout that ra he, uh, race. He, he, he but certainly the was. Yeah, he looked like he really put the pressure on Rafe there, and he knew that he had to go for 110%, probably lifetime best kind of performance but it did result in a slip in the middle of the wall that did hand it to Rafe in the end. Yeah, unlucky.
unlucky for Josh because it looked like he had an amazing start to his race and that could have been a really good run for him and still was with an 8.2 but yeah unfortunately a, a big slip in the middle. Well, Hannah, it's supposed to be climbing for a reason. <laughs> Absolutely yeah, blistering sort of 30 minutes or so there. Just runs after runs after runs. There is a little bit of a chat going on backstage about what is going on with the male junior big final. We saw a false start from Alex Krizanowski uh, on the left-hand lane. And then Charlie, all he had to do was climb to the top to win the British Junior Championships. But he fell off as well. Um, so we are just waiting for official results there from the judging team, whether they will go again or that race is decided in some other fashion. Yeah, 25 minutes have been on air so far and three speed finals rocketed off and I have to say, thoroughly enjoyable ones as well, really close runs. No, definitely a really good mixture of... Um, personal best and great racing from people but also some disappointment from other people with some really unfortunate slips potentially caused by pressure or conditions or perhaps a mixture of the both of them um, but yeah all in all a very entertaining final and we saw in the speed male um, small final there Andrew Goodall you, you mentioned him as a local guy do you feel like that will have a knock-on effect onto the the other local speed climbers here at the Raffro Center not a negative one, I doubt. Um, I think everyone is sort of really behind all the local climbers. Matty Falls also a local climber here and also had a slightly disappointing race. So I do think it'll um, be a bit of a blow to both of them, but they'll be pleased that they had people here supporting them, all their friends, all their family. And I think it should soften it slightly for them. So the speed final isn't the only coverage that we have for you tonight here at the Edinburgh at Raffo Arena. We have the lead semi-finals for all of the categories starting at 6.55, so just under an hour's time. Looking forward to that one later on. Completely different discipline, whole different skill set, but nonetheless exciting, hopefully at 6.55. So do join us for that one. We will be uh, staying here in Raffo, but for Hannah and ourselves, a cup of tea time, I would say. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Hello and welcome to City Climb, where we take a look at our favourite climbing cities, sing its praises and tell you why we love it. I'm Amy. And I'm Ness. And today we're here to tell you all about Sheffield. Sheffield is known as the climbing capital of the UK and it's not hard to see why. It has no less than five major climbing centres, easy access to the Peak District and some of the best outdoor climbing in the country. And best of all, there are literally thousands of site climbers like us. So no wonder people have been coming to Sheffield to train, climb, party for many years now. So let's take a look at the indoor climbing walls. We're here at the Foundry Climbing Centre, which opened over 30 years ago and pretty much launched modern day climbing. There is just so much history here. Probably most famous is the unique wave bouldering wall, which is as well loved today as it's ever been. So on the other side of the history spectrum, is the hangar, Sheffield's newest climbing centre. And like every other wall in Sheffield, it's buzzing with climbers from beginners to experts. As well as this, we have awesome walls with its lead, speed and bouldering. We have the ultra modern depot, and finally our personal favourite, the climbing works. Truly Sheffield, you're simply spoiling us. So as a climber, why do you love Sheffield? I just love like, the whole community of it. There's so many people that you see every day and like everybody knows everyone, so you always have someone to go climbing with. And of course, the Peak District is just right there. So if it's a nice day, you can just nip out before work and have a great time. How important do you think the Sheffield climbing scene is? Well, I'd say Sheffield is the mecca of UK climbing. Yeah. I've been climbing for around seven years in Sheffield now and everybody's oh. really friendly and it's just a lovely place to be. 
So how do you find the balls in Sheffield? Um, I mean, I've really been enjoying climbing recently. I've had membership for about a month and a half and I've been coming like every other day, kind of three, four times a week. Um, yeah, it's really good. Indoor, outdoor, indoor, outdoor. What about outdoor climbing? Well, you have come to the right place. The Peak District is right on our doorstep and has more brilliant climbs, closer to more people than you could shake a clipstick at. This BMC guidebooks has some of the best climbing on gritstone. And these two hold more than 3,000 traditional and sport climbs on limestone. Mind blowing. So for gritstone, the easiest place to get to is right here, the beautiful Burbage Valley, just on the outskirts of town. An easy 20 minute bus journey from the city centre. And once you hop out of the Fox House, you are on the doorstep to 700 brilliant climbs from moderate to E10 and 300 boulder problems from the easiest to the very hardest. Oh wow, should keep you busy. <laughs> should keep you busy. <laughs> And for sport climbing, it's only a quick hop down the hill to Horseshoe Quarry, with over 250 climbs in the 5s, 6s and 7s. Now, if you're venturing outside for the first time, be sure to check out the BMC Respect the Rock video series. These short films give you a little heads up into some of the things to consider before taking your first steps outside. So a great way to start getting outside is by joining a club. And today we're joined by Jen, the president of the Peak Climbing Club. So Jen, what could we get out of joining? So it's a really good opportunity. It's sociable, you can get out and organise meets, you can learn new skills, and it's all about joining the community. Oh, sick, and can anyone join? Absolutely, whether you're starting out, it's for everyone, everyone's welcome. Oh, I think we're definitely sold. So we are joined by BMC ambassador Molly Thompson Smith. So Molly, what attracted you to Sheffield? Well, I moved up from London a couple of years ago, mainly for the climbing community and to be close to the Peak District. Oh, nice. And so how are you finding it so far? Yeah, I'm loving it. I'm still here. Um, it's much easier to focus on my training for the World Cups and it's just a slower pace of life compared to London, which is really enjoyable. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this seems like a definite recommendation for Molly. There you have it, a little taste of what Sheffield has to offer if you're a climber. For more information about the walls, climbing outside, the clubs and all the work the BMC do, be sure to check the link in the description. We've been living and climbing here now for four years and we've got to say that for us, it's, it's a thumbs, thumbs up Sheffield. presentation. And in first place, Charlie Wardlaw. Just in time as I jumped back into the commentary box, first place and the British Championship in the male junior category, Charlie Wardrop won that big final. Great race it was between Alex and Charlie. One false start. 
and one fails, which is a bit of a tricky one to pick up. Those guys who do make the May Junior podium here today, Kenzie Allen in third place. Into the female senior category, third place, it's Savina Fillingham with that great time of 11.83, bronze medal for her. Start in that small final. Ava Hamilton, though, does take second place, just picked up close by Louise Flockhart in that incredible female senior run. If you did miss it, go back and watch that because that was really neck and neck all the way up the wall. Taking the win today, though, and your new female senior British champion, Louise Flockhart. Great work from Louise, and uh, yeah, fist bump and a high five at the top of the wall between Louise and Eva. Following that, a short break before the lead semi-finals. Back to the speed though, third place, it's Andrew Goodall. Great time of a 6.12, improved throughout all three runs on that wall. 6.12 for Andrew, take that bronze medal for the local chap. Ross Green's second place silver medal. We really had to put everything on the wall tonight to try and beat the first place winner, Rafe. It was brilliant all the way through. Rafe Stokes down in the five seconds, 5.78 there for Rafe. Takes a well-deserved gold medal here today. Great to see British speed climbing on the up. That is our free podium presentations, male junior, female senior and male senior. And we'll be back live with you at 6.55 for the lead semi-finals.
I think I joined the BMC when I was about 11 years old. Um, so I could compete for, or try to compete for GB and enter all my regional um, competitions that I was so excited to do. Uh, I also think the BMC could improve EDI by uh, making climbing more accessible for all sorts of people. For example, families from, with low income or people in the city who just don't have access to the outdoors or don't see it as a place for them. The BMC ensures that we can all have access to climbing crags across the country and that everyone using them is looking after them. They're clean and the rock is in good quality, so that's really important to me as an outdoor climber. And then for competitions, they ensure that I can get away and actually be insured whilst I'm competing, which not many insurance companies actually do, so that's really important to me. And lastly, they are really keen on promoting diversity within climbing and it's so nice to work with an organisation that shares the same passions as I do and has the same ideals and visions for where climbing should be. I hope as a BMC ambassador I'm able to be a role model for those people who might not see themselves um, looking the same as other people within the climbing community. So hopefully I'll be able to reach a new audience for the BMC but also speak to their climbers who've been going for a long time. I think climbing has changed already quite a lot because of the Olympics. Um, there are loads more climbing walls in the across the country and also I think the style is changing so that even the easier boulders are a lot more fun and interesting and more like comp style so people can really have a go at what they've seen in the Olympics at their local gym. Lots of people consider the outdoors as a free space that's open to everyone. But for a lot of people, it really doesn't feel that way. So we've brought you here today to find out one thing. Is the outdoors an eco space? Take three steps forward if you have no sole care responsibilities. I found it really difficult to get my kids outdoors because I can't afford the equipment for them. Take three steps forward if you have access to your vehicle. I have to rely on the unreliable public transport. Take three steps forward if you've never had a disability or a long-standing health problem. If you've always been able to afford to access the outdoors. When I went on one of my first trips, I did not have like the right equipment. The sole care of four children, um, I found it really difficult to get my kids outdoors because um, I can't afford the equipment for them. My aunties and uncles, they split and bought, I don't know how much it costs, but um, it's Gore-Tex, I'm guessing it's quite expensive. They split and bought it for me as a gift. If getting outdoors has always been part of your family or community life, yeah, so I know through my parents, I, I've had to have other people influence me to go out and things like that. My mum, she's really into the countryside and everything, so she she always took us out. If you don't have that connection, if you don't have someone who show you out there or take you, how, do you, how are you going to find out about it? Take three steps forward if you've never struggled from a mental health condition. Take three steps forward if you always see people like you in the outdoors. Sometimes I'm the only black person in the outdoors. And when I go climbing, most people often ask the question, you're a climber. Like when I go outside, I don't see people that. Take three steps forward if you find it easy to find kit in your size. I'm a size 20, size 22. And, um, I was struggling to find good technical clothing. I mean, the weather conditions get tougher. Um, you're actually putting yourself at risk. I started looking at that mountain rescue rescues, and a lot of it was down to people not having the right clothing gear. And actually, for me, it's because I can't get it. It's not that I don't want it. I just can't get it. Now look around you and see where you are. We've all got the same hill to climb, but we don't all have the same start line. A 
very conscious, and particularly in a way that I wasn't years ago, that I have been very fortunate. There's quite a gap. Um, that's what I realised when we were there, and that gap could be due to not having a good relationship with um, parents and whatnot. They're usually the ones to incentivize their children to take part in stuff like this, and not having them around can impact multiple areas. I want to give myself a big pat on the back for the resilience that I've sort of like displayed in my life, which they do make the effort to be in green spaces, despite whatever, you know, despite like the challenges I have to kind of make that happen, I make it happen. But I'm proud of the fact that, you know, my daughter was a couple of steps ahead of me. Today, I, I do, I feel, I genuinely feel bad. Um, I think we're we're all happy to kind of operate in our own little world, aren't we? And we just kind of, I'm going to go out for a walk, and you don't really take the time to think about the fact that actually there are others that would possibly like to do this, and they just can't. Yeah, absolutely, access is not available for everybody, not in the way it should be. There are a multitude of invisible barriers to the outdoors for many people, which disproportionately affects marginalised communities in society. An estimated 2.1 billion in health costs could be saved if everyone had good access to green space. The pleasure and the life fulfilling experiences one can have, I'm just so sorry that it's not so easy for others to experience the things that I have. And it'd be great if more people had those opportunities. Please share this video to show your support and help us push for an outdoors that is truly accessible to all. So I guess the question is why are we here? And these days I'm looking for a bit more than just hard routes. It doesn't have to be hard. I'm looking for routes that really inspire me. Routes that have maybe got a bit more layers than sport climbing. Traditional climbing is just so amazing in the fact that you've, you've got to like work with what nature's given you. And the whole protection thing just massively adds to it. Now, I wouldn't say I'm a real expert traditional climber. I'm certainly not a bold traditional climber, so when I heard about this route, Jamie's route, and the voyage, and I got the feeling the protection was reasonable, that really inspired me. So Steve was pretty keen, started asking me some information on um, routes that I'd done or would recommend. Um, obviously, after telling him about some of the classics, I had to point him at my route, Le Voyage, which in a very uh, Steve McClaw style, said he probably thought it'd be a bit too hard for him, but he might come and have a look. Uh, I think deep down, I knew that he'd be here looking at my new route with me eventually, and climbing Le Voyage would just be a matter of time. Even if he doesn't believe in himself, I think we all believe in Stephen McClaw to get to the top of things. Anot is one of the places to go. Uh, so I've come here when I was much younger for bouldering and then the trad developed little by little. And it was actually Lionel, uh, a local, who, um, who showed us the place around uh, a long time ago, like seven years ago. And James weirdly had been tipped off by Tom Randall about a potential line which was going to become Le Voyage. I find it quite shameful that it's a British guy who's going to show to a British guy about a French route in France. But yeah, I think James has nailed it here. It's, it's not a death route. It is run out, so you can take massive robs on hard moves. So it's, it's got that factor to it. But a lot of climbing, like 40 metres. And as you saw before the last, like five foot, like flared off fingers, finger crack. It's like 12 days. So I don't know, it's good, it's, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, nothing for your right hand any, at any point. Just give me one crimp. Maybe there. Oh, that's a scary move, that one.
Okay, check again. Oh, tough. Depends how gripped you are. Well, that's quite a good cam, actually. Whew. That's really quite warm. I'm just going to drop this top off because I'm melting. Right, how do we do this move? That might be it. That's a very, very small foothold. Oh dear. <laughs> That's the sort of foothold I can imagine absolutely pinging off. Oh, yeah. oh, that's rubbish. <laughs> That'll be fun. Okay, patch takers there, mate. Oh. Okay. Well, first impressions. Pretty flipping hard. Harder than I thought it was going to be. Kind of thought it might be a bit easier than that. I don't know why. Like sort of wall climbing with edges on it, I can usually sort of pull on them a bit, but it's so flipping complicated. Like, it feels like it's coming together, but normally it doesn't have to come together. You normally you get a hold and you pull on it and you get a next hold. But this is like, you get a hold and you've got to work out how to use it, your feet are all over the place. <sighs> wow. Not sure what to think. More work required, like a lot. Well, once he's got it dialed, he knows what he's doing. He seems to go up a gear, and then he, he, he just, when he gets moving, he just keeps on moving. He seems to have these sort of reserves of endurance that just mere mortals don't seem to be able to find very easily. I must admit, I, I, I find it quite hard to work out exactly why I get drawn to certain things. I suppose that the beauty of rock climbing is there's so many different styles that you can get into. And I used to be just a traditional climber. That was all I was inspired by. And then I got into the sport climbing and I've kind of moved back into traditional climbing. But I, I really appreciate the, the extra layer that you get with traditional climbing. And it doesn't have to be super hard. It's just gotta be something that really inspires me. Part of that could be due to getting a bit older. Maybe I've sort of let the bar drop a little. Maybe I'm not as strong and maybe I'm not as fit as I used to be. So I'm looking for something which um, I feel capable of doing, which is gonna give me as much rewarding experiences, but it's not just about the numbers. And in a way, like, even if I don't succeed, that's maybe not such a problem. It's the, uh, the trying hard and trying something really cool is what it's all about. Okay. Okay, down. I'll clip some. Yeah, I think I should do. Yesterday was a, a really good day. Pretty knackering, to be honest. Only spent two goes at the route, but two goes was a lot of climbing. So my plan today is I'm feeling a bit tired, so I could try and top rope it, but I'm not sure I'm gonna get much information from top roping, so I'm gonna give it a sort of, I say a lead attempt, but it's more like a let's lead it and see where I get to. I'm not really, I'm not confident I'll, I'll do it. I'm very unconfident of that. I'm not really trying to do it, but I, I feel like I need to lead, attempt it 
to feel how the protection fits in, whether my body position is right to place the protection, whether it's fiddly, whether it's actually too hard to place potentially. Uh, maybe I feel like psychologically like I need more or maybe I feel like I don't need it. So there's a lot to learn which I don't think I'll get by top roping.
Deus. Oh my god, oh, I've not thought of that for a while, if not ever. <laughs> what a roof! Hey James, that is just such a roof. That is such a roof. Oh yeah, that was it. Was that show? Sure? Just a sec man, that was that like a battle and a half. <laughs> I'm not sure I deserve that. I'll take it man. Wow, that was wild. That was so cool. Right, I'm done. <laughs> Take me down! Oh wow. Oh, oh man, not as speechless as I was up there. I, literally my mouth is so dry, it felt like someone pouring chalk into it. <laughs> that was like, that, that. that was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can appreciate how close that was to falling off. But it was just such a good example of grit and determination. That was amazing. My main thing is, don't like giving up. Don't like giving up. Yeah. But yeah, wow, what a good route, man. Even if it had been easier, it wouldn't have been such a fight. And the fight was like, that was the thing I'll take home. That was the thing I'll take home, is that absolute fear and panic of just like, I'm going to fall off going for an absolute jug and I so <laughs> nearly did and go a long way. Man, that was close. Come on, come on, hold it, come on. Yeah. <laughs> 
If I'm setting a comp, the first thing you do is you choose your holds. Um, and having good holds, stuff that is inspiring, stuff that is different, that doesn't look the same as everybody else's, is always the key thing. So a set is if there's something new, there's something exciting, something we haven't seen before, something that we haven't played with, that we want to experiment with, then that's, that's kind of what inspires us. You say like root set is like a conductor with an orchestra and they've got lots of different stuff. They've got a climbing wall, they've got holds and volumes. And the idea is to bring it all together to make to make something which is which is beautiful. Hello and welcome to City Climb, where we take a look at our favourite climbing cities, sing its praises and tell you why we love it. I'm Amy and I'm Ness and today we're here to tell you all about Sheffield! Sheffield is known as the climbing capital of the UK and it's not hard to see why. It has no less than five major climbing centres, easy access to the Peak District and some of the best outdoor climbing in the country. And best of all, there are literally thousands of site climbers like us. So no wonder people have been coming to Sheffield to train, climb, party for many years now. So let's take a look at the indoor climbing walls. We're here at the Foundry Climbing Centre, which opened over 30 years ago and pretty much launched modern day climbing. There is just so much history here. Probably most famous is the unique wave bouldering wall, which is as well loved today as it's ever been. So on the other side of the history spectrum, is the hangar, Sheffield's newest climbing centre. And like every other wall in Sheffield, it's buzzing with climbers from beginners to experts. As well as this, we have awesome walls with its lead, speed and bouldering. We have the ultra modern depot, and finally our personal favourite, the climbing works. Truly Sheffield, you're simply spoiling us. So as a climber, why do you love Sheffield? I just love like, the whole community of it. There's so many people that you see every day and like everybody knows everyone, so you always have someone to go climbing with. And of course, the Peak District is just right there. So if it's a nice day, you can just nip out before work and have a great time. How important do you think the Sheffield climbing scene is? Well, I'd say Sheffield is the mecca of UK climbing. Yeah. I've been climbing for around seven years in Sheffield now and everybody's wow. really friendly and it's just a lovely place to be. So how do you find the balls in Sheffield? Um, I mean, I've really been enjoying climbing recently. I've had membership for about a month and a half and I've been coming like every other day, kind of three, four times a week. Um, yeah, it's really good. Indoor, outdoor, indoor, outdoor. What about outdoor climbing? Well, you have come to the right place. The Peak District is right on our doorstep and has more brilliant climbs, closer to more people than you could shake a clipstick at. This BMC guidebooks has some of the best climbing on gritstone. And these two hold more than 3,000 traditional and sport climbs on limestone. Mind blowing. So for gritstone, the easiest place to get to is right here, the beautiful Burbage Valley, just on the outskirts of town. An easy 20 minute bus journey from the city center. And once you hop out of the Fox House, you are on the doorstep to 700 brilliant climbs from moderate to E10 and 300 boulder problems from the easiest to the very hardest. Oh wow, should keep you busy. <laughs> should keep you busy. <laughs> And for sport climbing, it's only a quick hop down the hill to Horseshoe Quarry, with over 250 climbs in the 5s, 6s and 7s. Now, if you're venturing outside for the first time, be sure to check out the BMC Respect the Rock video series. These short films give you a little heads up into some of the things to consider before taking your first steps outside. 
So a great way to start getting outside is by joining a club. And today we're joined by Jen, the president of the Peak Climbing Club. So Jen, what could we get out of joining? So it's a really good opportunity. It's sociable, you can get out and organise meets, you can learn new skills, and it's all about joining the community. Oh, sick, and can anyone join? Absolutely, whether you're starting out, it's for everyone, everyone's welcome. Oh, I think we're definitely sold. So we are joined by BMC ambassador Molly Thompson-Smith. So Molly, what attracted you to Sheffield? Well, I moved up from London a couple years ago, mainly for the climbing community and to be close to the Peak District. Oh, nice. And so how are you finding it so far? Yeah, I'm loving it. I'm still here. Um, it's much easier to focus on my training for the World Cups and it's just a slower pace of life compared to London, which is really enjoyable. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this seems like a definite recommendation for Molly. There you have it, a little taste of what Sheffield has to offer if you're a climber. For more information about the walls, climbing outside, the clubs and all the work the BMC do, be sure to check the link in the description. We've been living and climbing here now for four years and we've got to say that for us, it's, it's a thumbs, thumbs up Sheffield. I think I joined the BMC when I was about 11 years old, um, so I could compete for, or try to compete for GB and enter all my regional um, competitions that I was so excited to do. Uh, I also think the BMC could improve EDI by uh, making climbing more accessible for all sorts of people, for example, families from, with low income or people in the city who just don't have access to the outdoors or don't see it as a place for them. The BMC ensures that we can all have access to climbing crags across the country and that everyone using them is looking after them. They're clean and the rock is in good quality, so that's really important to me as an outdoor climber. And then for competitions, they ensure that I can get away and actually be insured whilst I'm competing, which not many insurance companies actually do, so that's really important to me. And lastly, they are really keen on promoting diversity within climbing and it's so nice to work with an organisation that shares the same passions as I do and has the same ideals and visions for where climbing should be. I hope as a BMC ambassador I'm able to be a role model for those people who might not see themselves um, 
looking the same as other people within the climbing community. So hopefully I'll be able to reach a new audience for the BMC, but also speak to their climbers who've been going for a long time. I think climbing has changed already quite a lot because of the Olympics. Um, there are loads more climbing walls in the across the country and also I think the style is changing so that even the easier boulders are a lot more fun and interesting and more like comp style so people can really have a go at what they've seen at the Olympics at their local gym. Lots of people consider the outdoors as a free space that's open to everyone. But for a lot of people, it really doesn't feel that way. So we've brought you here today to find out one thing. Is the outdoors an eco space? Take three steps forward if you have no sole care responsibilities. I found it really difficult to get my kids outdoors because I can't afford the equipment for them. Take three steps forward if you have access to your vehicle. I have to rely on the unreliable public transport. Take three steps forward if you've never had a disability or a long-standing health problem. If you've always been able to afford to access the outdoors. When I went on one of my first trips, I did not have like the right equipment. The sole care of four children, um, I found it really difficult to get my kids outdoors because um, I can't afford the equipment for them. My aunties and uncles, they split and bought, I don't know how much it costs, but um, it's Gore-Tex, I'm guessing it's quite expensive. They split and bought it for me as a gift. If getting outdoors has always been part of your family or community life, yeah, so I know through my parents, so I've had to have other people influence me to go out and things like that. My mum, she's really into the countryside and everything, so she, she always took us out. If you don't have that connection, if you don't have someone who show you out there or take you, how, do you, how are you going to find out about it? Take three steps forward if you've never struggled from a mental health condition. Take three steps forward if you always see people like you in the outdoors. Sometimes I'm the only black person in the outdoors. And when I go climbing, most people often ask the question, you're a climber. Like when I go outside, I don't see people that. Take three steps forward if you find it easy to find kit in your size. I'm a size 20, size 22. And, um, I was struggling to find good technical clothing. I mean, the weather conditions get tougher. Um, you're actually putting yourself at risk. I started looking at that mountain rescue rescues, and a lot of it was down to people not having the right clothing gear. And actually, for me, it's because I can't get it. It's not that I don't want it. I just can't get it. Now look around you and see where you are. We've all got the same hill to climb, but we don't all have the same start line. I'm very conscious, and particularly in a way that I wasn't years ago, that I have been very fortunate. There's quite a gap. Um, that's what I realised when we were there, and that gap could be due to not having a good relationship with um, parents and whatnot. They're usually the ones to incentivise their children to take part in stuff like this and not having them around can impact multiple areas. I want to give myself a big pat on the back for the resilience that I've sort of like displayed in my life. I actually do make the effort to be in green spaces despite whatever, you know, despite like the challenges I have to kind of make that happen. I make it happen, but I'm proud of the fact that you know, my daughter was a couple of steps ahead of me. Today, I, I do, I feel, I genuinely feel bad. Um, I think we, we're all happy to kind of operate in our own little world, aren't we? And we just kind of, I'm going to go out for a walk. And you don't really take the time to think about the fact that actually there are others that would possibly like to do this and they just can't. Yeah, absolutely. Access is not available for everybody. It's not in the way it should be. 
There are a multitude of invisible barriers to the outdoors for many people, which disproportionately affects marginalised communities in society. An estimated 2.1 billion in health costs could be saved if everyone had good access to green space. The pleasure and the life fulfilling experiences one can have, I'm just so sorry that it's not so easy for others to experience the things that I have. And it'd be great if more people had those opportunities. Please share this video to show your support and help us push for an outdoors that is truly accessible to all. So I guess the question is why are we here? And these days I'm looking for a bit more than just hard roots. It doesn't have to be hard. I'm looking for roots that really inspire me. Roots that have maybe got a bit more layers than sport climbing. Traditional climbing is just so amazing in the fact that you've, you've got to like work with what nature's given you. And the whole protection thing just massively adds to it. Now, I wouldn't say I'm a real expert traditional climber. I'm certainly not a bold traditional climber, so when I heard about this route, Jamie's route, and the voyage, and I got the feeling the protection was reasonable, that really inspired me. So Steve was pretty keen, started asking me some information on um, routes that I'd done or would recommend. Um, obviously, after telling him about some of the classics, I had to point him at my route, Le Voyage, which in a very uh, Steve McClure style, said he probably thought it'd be a bit too hard for him, but he might come and have a look. Uh, I think deep down, I knew that he'd be here looking at my new route with me eventually, and climbing Le Voyage would just be a matter of time. Even if he doesn't believe in himself, I think we all believe in Stephen McClure to get to the top of things. Anot is one of the places to go. Uh, so I've come here when I was much younger for bouldering and then the trad developed little by little. And it was actually Lionel, uh, a local, who, um, who showed us the place around uh, a long time ago, like seven years ago. And James weirdly had been tipped off by Tom Randall about a potential line which was going to become Le Voyage. I find it quite shameful that it's a British guy who's going to show to a British guy about a French route in France. But... Yeah, I think James has nailed it here. It's, it's not a death route. It is run out, so you can take massive robs on hard moves. So it's, it's got that factor to it. But a lot of climbing, like 40 metres. And as you saw before the last, like five foot, like flared off fingers, finger crack. It's like 12 d So I don't know. It's good. It's yeah. It's hard. Yeah, nothing for your right hand any, at any point. Just give me one crimp. Maybe there. Oh, that's a scary move. That one. Okay, take again. Poor, tough. Depends how gripped you are. Well, that's quite a good cam, actually. Whew. That's really quite warm. I'm just going to drop this top off because I'm melting. Right, how do we do this move? That's a very, very small foothold. Oh dear. <laughs> That's the sort of foothold I can imagine absolutely pinging off. Ah, 
Blah. Tenuous. Come on. No. Good link, though. Hello and a warm welcome to the second live stream this weekend of the British Speed, Lead and Paraclimbing Championships hosted here by the British Mountaineering Council and GB Climbing. This championship marks a welcome return to Edinburgh, the city that has previously hosted the IFSC Lead and Speed World Cup. Believe it or not, Rafo is the largest and only climbing centre in the UK with international standard competition walls for lead and speed. And we get going here tonight with the lead semi-finals for the veteran categories, men and women, and the senior male and female categories. I'm Mike Langley, and I'll be guiding you through all the action this weekend. And alongside me once again, XGB athlete Hannah Smith. And Hannah, how is it for you being back in this arena, uh, considering you've won this event back in 2018? Yeah, I won the Junior British Championships back in 2018 right here, uh, which is my home wall. So it was very exciting at the time. And... Wow, it's changed a lot since um, I was competing here. The holds that are on the wall today are huge and really modern and make for some really exciting routes, um, even compared to what it was like five years ago. So it's incredible to see actually how far this sport has come, even since its first Olympics, um, and the changes that have been implemented since then as well. So Hannah is going to be giving us her expert guidance all throughout this semi-final that will take place over the next hour and a half or so. So... If you're new to speed, uh, speed climbing, we've done speed climbing. If you're new to lead climbing, this is the semi-final round. So it's all about height on the wall, endurance, of course, of the forearms and route reading. Athletes are going to climb tied into a rope. They will climb one at a time over these massive overhanging routes here at the Rafa Arena and a six-minute time limit. Basically, it's whoever gets to the highest point will win the round. And tonight we are looking for the top six men and top six women to go through to tomorrow morning's final. In the veteran category, we've got one lady and three guys. So that's uh, automatic qualification for finals. So they're going out there to uh, prove themselves, hopefully get the best score if there is a situation of count back for tomorrow. And we are expecting the athletes to arrive soon enough on the stage and in front of the walls here at Raffo for the observation of the routes. And Hannah, that's always quite an interesting experience. Yes, definitely. So the athletes will have six minutes to read the routes. Um, and during that time, they'll speak to each other, discuss how they think they're going to do the climb, if there are any holds they don't recognise, maybe ask another competitor. It really does show how social this sport actually is and how supportive the competitors can be with each other as well. Now, it really is about actually the climber against the route rather than the climber against the other climbers. Although at the end of the day, our top six climbers will be going through to tomorrow's final. And there's actually quite a lot on the line here obviously this is the semi-final round so um, we're looking to get through down to six people for uh, tomorrow's final but there's stake on the GB team and, and quite a lot of stuff going on with selection as well so there's quite a lot of pressure on the guys here including your brother who's going to be coming out third from last. Yeah so this weekend is part of the GB climbing selection uh, process the top three climbers from this event in the men's and the women's will be eligible to go to GB selection next February I think. So, um, yeah, there are certainly a lot of men and women in this competition that are gunning for those spaces, and actually it will determine their whole next season. So, yeah, high pressure. High pressure indeed. So the athletes now are brought out into the arena. They have been in a collective isolation room way out of sight of the wall, so they actually can't see the routes beforehand and they can't see each other climb. So they will have that six-minute period that Hannah was talking about. That's our female veteran on the far left hand side April Velch, John Banyard Nigel Leeming and James Pollard on her left hand side followed by, we've got 12 women, I'm not actually going to read those all out back to back just now, we'll get, we've got plenty of air time for them coming up and 12 guys So the athletes have been in isolation um, for the past maybe 45 minutes or so um, 
and in there that's in the bouldering room in Rathal, they'll have been warming up, maybe stretching, doing some extra climbing. They did climb in qualifiers this morning, so all of these climbers have tried two routes. So we'll potentially still be warm from those, but yeah, we'll have been warming up for the past 45 minutes or so before coming out to read these routes um, with the other climbers as well. So there you can see it, a lot of strong looking athletes who are going to drop into that six minutes. The veteran category routes are on the far left hand side of the arena on the overhanging grey section. I think they call it the previous comp wall here before the new comp wall is right in the centre in the orange and grey. We have got the women on the left hand side of centre starting on the yellow and blue holds and the guys will be on right of centre which is the yellow and black holds to start with anyway and then the colours break out from there on so it's basically right up the centre of the wall and Hannah you've obviously trained on this wall quite a lot you've competed on the wall what is it like as a facility it's obviously one of the biggest ones in the country and it's a, it's a pretty epic feature yeah, it's quite. An, it's actually quite an intimidating wall just because it's so exposed. We're in this massive arena and all eyes really are on you when you're on that wall. But the wall gets gradually more overhanging as you get higher up until the last maybe metre or so. But really, there are only a couple of holds on that section. So, yeah, generally speaking, the climbers will want to be climbing fairly quickly through the start so that they can save their energy for the more overhanging, powerful climbing towards the top of the wall. So in the veteran category, they've actually got 60 moves before the top there, 44 moves in the women's final and 48 moves, 49 moves in the men's semi-final. You've got six minutes to look at these routes. That's how much of those 48 to 60 moves can you actually remember when you go back to the isolation zone? I think you'd be surprised how much of these routes these climbers can remember. Obviously, a lot of these climbers will be very well versed in how this goes. They'll have done a lot of competitions before, certainly have read an awful lot of routes in their time. Um, but yeah, they are fairly good at remembering sequences and the more they discuss them in this six minutes and the more they go over and over them, um, the more they'll retain. Um, they'll also look for different things every time they read the route. One time they might be looking at the sequence alone for their hands, then they'll maybe add in footholds. They'll be looking for rest positions, places to clip, even just little things to watch out for. Um, maybe good, um, good holds to use for heel hooks and things like that that'll take weight off your hands. Um, or even things like black tape, although there isn't some on this route, so that's not relevant for now. Yeah, one thing for us to look out is the previous routes from the qualifying rounds earlier today. So these athletes have been through two qualification routes this morning. They've had a four or five hour break and now they're into the far, uh, semi-final round. But the um, qualification routes are still on the far left hand side. That's the green route on the far left and the pinks, predominantly pink holds on the right hand side. So that, those routes are not included in this. The athletes will be well aware of that. Apparently, if you do touch it with your foot, um, the judges are going to allow that. It's not been black taped, so they can crack on, but chances of them actually using it apparently are extremely slim. Yeah, so this has become a lot more relevant in recent years, actually. Up until recently, generally, routes and competitions have been predominantly the same colour of hold. Whereas nowadays, especially on this men's route, you see yellow, black, orange holds all over the route. Um, and it doesn't sort of stick to one colour all the way up. And actually, those pink holds are within reach, so they would be able to use them should they want to, but the route setters have sort of deemed that they're not going to be that useful for them, therefore haven't black taped them off. But yeah, you do see this a lot more nowadays, especially with the variety of hold types, brands, shapes that you can get. Why stick to one colour when you've got all these possibilities? Yeah, I think one of the large elements of the idea behind changing the colour of the route as the route went up is for the viewing audience to try and differentiate between the various sections and for us in the commentary position to help to describe to you viewers at home for example you get through the the yellow section and then start getting into the sort of the, the higher up blue things like that you start to see a lot more in the world cups in this scenario a more of a british championship level it's not quite so obvious so we'll do our very best to talk you through all 60 or so moves as the climbers work their way up if you have just joined us, Mike Langley and Hannah Smith here in the commentary position. This is the semi-final round at the British Championships for the male and female veteran category, women and male senior category. They are, all the athletes you can see down there on the mats uh, are in the observation phase. Just a couple of minutes left for their six-minute route observation. And they'll go back into the, the isolation zone. And one by one, they'll start tackling these routes. See the three veteran categories there. All sitting down on the floor. 
have to say it's not something I've ever done is sit down on the floor, but... Very relaxed. Maybe a bit easier on your neck as well. I was about to make a really <laughs> untimely joke about that type of age and you have to have a sit down, but <laughs> considering the quality of these guys climbing, that might be a bit unfair. But they're all good friends of mine, so maybe I can get away with it. Were you ever a climber, Hannah, to go back into the isolation zone and make diagrams or drawings of the route? I personally wasn't, but I have seen it done. Um, some climbers will come out, you see Thea there with her binoculars to get a much better look at the route so she can sort of gauge what kind of hold she's going to be getting on near the top. Because obviously when you're at the top of the route, you're going to be a lot more tired, so you'd like to know what you're doing a little bit more. It would definitely help. Um, but yeah, people do go in and draw diagrams of the route to try and help them remember it. Um, definitely helps with that pattern recall, doesn't it? It's quite interesting on this British level, obviously everyone's pretty much speaking the same language and on the international stage we do see a few language barrier issues if people want to confer to describe the moves to each other, but here it seems to be a little bit more individual just looking at the people out there. No, definitely, especially in the senior categories. Um, we do have quite a young field here this weekend. I think some of the eldest athletes are maybe only 23 or so, so uh, definitely a young category. And lots of these climbers have been on the GB youth team together, maybe travelled to different countries and events. Um, so they are all very familiar with, the, with each other and probably really good friends as well. Um, so yeah, definitely no barriers there to helping each other read the routes. Yeah, just to give you an idea of date of birth, this senior category, you need to be born in 2006 or earlier. So that's the sort of ages that we're talking about. Six minute observation period has finished. So the guys now will head back and there'll be a moment of pause whilst the first climbers out, which will be in the veteran category, should be April Welch. Uh, get their gear together, get themselves ready, a moment to compose themselves. Did you ever have a preference in a semi-final round or a final round, whether you preferred to come out early or come out later on in the round? Um, I never actually got to compete in semi-finals. There were uh, never really semi-finals in the British Championships. I'm pretty sure this might be the first one. Uh, don't hold me to that. Um, so I never actually had to, but certainly in finals, um, I definitely preferred to go out a bit earlier. You've not got any pressure on you. You can just climb to as high as you possibly can, and then you get to watch the other competitors as well. Um, I did have to come out last once, and I knew that the girl before me had topped the route, and definitely one of the most stressful experiences of my life. Um, but yeah, I think there's just different pressures associated with coming out either early or late. So some people do have a preference, but to be honest, it's kind of stressful either way. Well, and we wouldn't be climbers without talking about the conditions of the, the heat, the, uh, humidity, skin and things like that. Is This arena can be um, quite conditions-y, it can be very uh, cold and humid in the winter, quite hot and humid in the summer. It's getting later on here at local time, just after 7 o'clock. Conditions are okay, but it still feels pretty sweaty. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't think it's something a lot of the competitors coming here this weekend really expected. Um, we hosted the European Championships back in 2019, and that was cold. Um, and that was in September as well, whereas this year, I saw people in the car park this morning turning up with their big doobie jackets, and certainly not needed in here. There are people in here wearing t-shirts <laughs> quite comfortably, I'd say, and certainly we saw in the speed finals that conditions definitely playing a part tonight. It's humid, it's hot, the air feels really thick. Um, definitely not prime connies, so to speak. As they say, prime connies. Well, I will be getting a couple of route setters into the booth throughout this semi-final round, and hopefully I'll use that as an opportunity to ask them whether they did factor the conditions into the routes, whether they kind of steered away from lots of slopers and big pinches or maybe slightly more in cuts there's some of our route setting team looking glamorous as always there tired i have to say the route setters look that's pretty normal april welchstone is going to start us off here in this lead semi-final the only competitor in the female veteran category sadly so she's already through to tomorrow morning's final but going out there for a training lap really good effort from April and we've got three guys after that in the male veteran category so she'll be starting on the far left hand side of the wall with 60 moves in front of her yeah so this panel um, on what we call the old competition wall in Ratho um, is actually one of the longest bits of wall because it covers two roof sections um, so you can actually fit an awful lot of moves into that section of wall and um, varies from powerful to then going a little bit more slab or vertical towards the top 
Um, so yeah, there's definitely a lot of different styles of climbing within one route. Um, it would be good to see how April manages that. Maybe worth saying that April is from Edinburgh. She's local, she trains here a lot. I've definitely seen her at the wall a few times. Um, always a friendly face. Um, she did enter the BLCCs in the 1990s. Um, so his experience. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Hopefully the crowd here is building as the evening goes on. We'll start to get behind April as she progresses up this route. Routes of this nature do tend to build in difficulty. Start off relatively steady and start to build 60 moves is an extremely long route. A lot of times in the World Cups you might see 50 to 55 potentially for a long route. 60 is a bit of a beast. Yeah, time will definitely be a factor. Um, if she wants to top, she's definitely going to have to be thinking about climbing quite quickly through certain sections of the route. Um, but yeah, she knows this wall super well. She climbs here a lot. She'll definitely be aware of that, I imagine. Yeah, definitely a good point. After the veteran category, the male and female senior final will start and they'll be climbing side by side. As April starts to put in a little bit of a battle here. Pushing through that first really steep roof section. Still looking composed, showing that experience from those back in the day BLCC event entries. Lots of support for her and um, from the crowd here as well. Definitely a lot of people that will recognize her. Um, she has actually, she climbed an AA when she was 51 years old after having 15 years off climbing. Um, so Rachel definitely knows about putting in the try hard graft. Yeah, Ata at any age is no mean feat. So superb work here, Clear, clearly a talent and asking the audience for some support. Tricky little left foot move coming up, potentially standing on the front face of that grey triangle that you see down by her left foot. Roots said to say that you've really got to move through this section with a bit of confidence. There's that left foot placement, just smearing on the wall. Does have that confidence. Good work here from April. Showing that a bit of a local knowledge there as well, standing on the features of this old competition wall. Up into move 43 now, 44 is that right hand, 60 moves is the top. April doing really well working through that roof section. Um, wall starts to become slightly less overhanging if she can make it past this part of the route. Looks like she's really gassing now, you can see the pump building in the, in the arms but does go. Good work from April and the only climate in the category represented the female veterans extremely well there and we look forward to seeing her again tomorrow hopefully good night's rest we'll get those forearms uh, back into one piece and she'll be getting ready to fight again tomorrow oh she looked like she had a really good time and the veterans did get to choose whether they climbed in the semi-finals or not because obviously they get to go straight through to the finals anyway and they did choose to climb because they're all here for a good time at the end of the day and the more climbing they get to do the happier they'll probably be absolutely and inspiring performances will hopefully bring other veterans out get involved get involved in the blccs next year oh absolutely i think the more the merrier fist bumps to the judges here at Raffo. great atmosphere so far very friendly organizers seems to be the way here in scotland so out next we should have john banyard spoke to john quite a bit earlier often see him bouldering down in the london gyms kind of got coaxed into entering by nigel and james the other two male veterans suggesting to me that he might be more of a boulderer but he reassured me he does know how to tie a knot 
So that's a good start. So John starts his campaign. He's talking about potentially thinking about tactics. Understand that he's done two qualifying routes already today. As a bit of a bolder endurance might not necessarily come to him naturally, but needs to think about the finals tomorrow as well. Let's see how he goes about tackling this route. John becoming heavily involved in the climbing scene now, bringing brands and sponsored climbers into his chalk brands. You can see all the generations getting involved. I know you must see it quite a lot with new climbers coming through who aren't necessarily lead climbers naturally. All of the tactics of, of clipping, tactics of clipping, when to clip, where to clip, must become such a crucial part of the sport. No, definitely. Lead climbing is all about your decisions on the route, uh, where to clip, where to rest, where to climb quickly, where to climb slowly. And certainly, um, as a preferred boulder myself, <laughs> Um, definitely becomes important if you've not maybe got as much endurance as the other competitors and you're saying John's a, predominantly a boulderer and um, can be very very useful in hard sections of the route provided that you get it right to get to that point and have enough left in the tank to actually get through those moves but he seems to be making light work of this first roof section yeah nice little left toe hook there showing he has got experience Fairly positive holds to get through that roof section. And then Down coming the on to this section with the smeary volume foot move. Yeah, the first bit of spice on the route, currently around hold 33 now, and does drop sadly. Didn't quite get the left foot up there, but a good effort from John nonetheless, putting in a great performance and well attended here from John Manyard. No, it's a really good effort. That first roof is a lot more overhanging than it looks. I can see even being on it many times myself. It actually feels like you're almost climbing downwards a little bit because you end up climbing back the way. Um, not a feature that's in an awful lot of lead walls in the UK, so probably slightly unfamiliar with it. Um, but yeah, a good effort nonetheless. Yeah, you could see his arms just kind of gave out a little bit there. One of his friends, Matt Stiles West, is doing the belay duties here this weekend as well. Good scenes all round. Let's see where that leaves John in the free veteran male category. Nigel Leeming out next. James Pollard winning the qualification round. He'll be out after that. And I mentioned time on the route. John fell off around two third, uh, one third height there, just over one third, I would say creeping into half height with half of his time used just under three minutes there I think time if somebody does get towards the top which we are hoping with Nigel or James could definitely become a factor no definitely um, certainly the walls here are a lot higher than maybe a lot of the climbers in this event are used to apart from maybe the Edinburgh locals um, and I do wonder if we will see some of the local climbers um, setting off a little bit quicker, maybe just due to experience of the wall and knowing that it does get harder the higher you get up generally here. Um, so yeah, it would be interesting to see um, if we see that as a trend. Well, and when this wall was originally brought into use as a competition wall, the rules along the international lead was eight minutes at the time. Only in the recent few years it's been brought down to six minutes. So Nigel will have those six minutes in front of him. Incredible athlete, Nigel Leeming. Been around the competition scene for quite some time now. Loves his competing, loves his ninja warrior. Check him out on social media. Really great to see these guys going toe to toe, even though they're great friends. Yeah, Nigel, pretty experienced. Um, when asked, how, have he, has he entered the BLCCs before? He says, yes, I can't remember how many times. 
So clearly quite a few. Love the fact that what he wants to achieve is to beat James, who's out next. <laughs> yeah, and James's um, aim for the event is to come first, so clearly to beat Nigel as well. Right. <laughs> Good bit of friendly rivalry. Let's hope it remains that way. It's not often in the climbing competitions we see true bitter rivalries people kicking their chalk bags at each other but not in this sport anyway so Nigel just approaching the first of the roof section hole 23 at the moment definitely climbing a lot quicker than John um, maybe having entered this competition a few times has potentially climbed here before um, but definitely seems to be aware that climbing fast is going to pay dividends later on. Hannah, you're talking about when to move fast and when to move slow. Obviously, when you approach a roof section, you feel like that's the time to try and power through, use that bouldering strength to get through as quick as possible through the steep stuff back onto the easier terrain? I mean, it does depend on the route. Um, if there were to be a really good resting position in that roof, I'd say use it. But certainly this hold that Nigel is on just now is really slopey, um, but he is moving on to a jug. But I would say, yeah, the more weight you can get onto your legs, um, the better. And generally speaking on roofs, your weight tends to shift to your arms. Um, and I promise your arms will give way quite long before your legs will. interesting the way the setters have set this route usually this middle section between these two roofs offers a little bit of relief but with that volume as a foot I doubt it go is going to be for these climbers. Let's see now will Nigel start to stand on that left foot he does looks a little bit unsure about this is not really what lead climbers want they want to feel that security of having a hole but just double smears across the grey triangle there Nigel really stalling out a little bit here not got a clip just to his right hand side it's obviously having a look at but he's not 100 percent sure with that left foot position yeah, we, saw him, we saw him tentatively touch that feature that we saw april use earlier and maybe not quite sure if it's good enough for him to put his weight through now starts moving again obviously we're gonna have to start motoring here a little bit nigel not quite sure about that hold probably doesn't feel that good at that angle i have to say but coming on some slightly better ones on this volume. Approaching the upper sections of the route now, Nigel into hold 44 out of a possible 60 and the top. That second brutal roof section. Clearly showing a bit of fatigue there, Nigel. Good support here from the Rappo crowd. Got to power through this next section, stalling out a little bit on the left heel hook. And we saw the same from April. And does go. Oh, big battle. You can see his left hand just opening up there on hold 45, like a big tennis ball shaped sloper. His aim was to beat James Pollard, who's out next. Will Yet to a see score of, yeah, 45. Will it be enough? The so final competitor out in the male veterinary category will be James. After James, will be turning our wall straight to uh, attention straight to the main wall in the center of the arena here for the male and female senior category 13 men 12 women
So out into the arena, James Pollard. James now living up in Stockton, used to be based in London. Used to climb at the wall that I work at, the Castle Climbing Centre in London. Competes regularly on the bouldering competition circuit, started competing all around the place now. Absolutely brilliant, him and his wife here. Two kids at home, hopefully watching on. Interesting. Now I'm going to trip over myself with medical terms slightly here, but he works in the heart surgery department by day, boulderer by night. Big time doctor. Let's see what he makes of lead climbing. This is his first BLCCs. He has said that his strengths in climbing are technical slab boulders. Emphasis on the boulders. Um, although he qualified in first, so can't be that bad at rope climbing too. Yeah, I'm thinking if he does get to that smeary volume section, he might be a little bit more comfortable on there, maybe move through with speed. But he's uh, got quite a few moves, 35 moves to get there. Let's see if that bouldering power comes through. No doubt he has been training for this. have just joined us we're here at the final climber in the male veterinary category Mike Langley Hannah Smith here with you James Pollard on the wall at the moment this is the semi-final round veterans are all through to tomorrow's final round that starts tomorrow morning and just before 10 a.m. tomorrow do hope you can join us for all the finals tomorrow we've got these categories and we've got the para climbing finals tomorrow as well so do not miss out on that as James blasts through this roof section seemingly with no hesitation at all yeah, he seems to be making light work of this early section of the route. Um, you did think he would probably prefer this section with the technical foot swapping on that volume. Um, so, fingers crossed we get to see him on the next roof section as well. smoothly but a little bit of fatigue starting to show here for James left foot is powering down on that volume now just out of shot at the moment there's the tricky clip that Nigel was hesitating over no such hesitation for James Looking fairly comfortable shaking hands while smearing on the volume opting for that high foot rather than using that feature that we saw April use earlier interesting that she was the only one to use that Let's see if he can get onto this slightly slabbier, techier section at the top of the route. So James looking to win this round by progressing past hold 45. That is hold 45 where Nigel fell. So progression through here will put James into first position for today's semi-final, and he does. So he's looking good here. Got to make that next clip though, just around his knee height at the moment. Uh, this next section of the wall where that black rock city hold you can see he's got his hand on is it's actually slabby and um, so fingers crossed he'll get a little bit of relief on his arms there if he's got enough left in the tank to relax on that hold it is going to be technical but if he can relax into his feet a little bit he should get some energy back yes yeah, and quite straightforward in terms of root reading climbing up to this point and now it gets a lot more technical all of a sudden a little bit more volume based wrestling Getting really tangled up in the clips here a little bit here James that's gonna burn the forearms out pretty badly I don't think you'll worry about that too much though he won't have much of a mind on finals at the moment I don't think considering that is tomorrow morning yeah this route does seem to have changed very quickly from pumpy moves to contortion on volumes seems to have found the position body position out to the left though for James Pollard here looked like it the route wanted to push him right but he understood he had to go left there's that technical slab climbing technique that he says he in, really enjoys coming good for him here only yeah. the, only the head wall remains currently on hold 52. we saw him taking a little bit of a rest there shaking his hands out clearly feeling the pump yeah he has time remaining as well he's around four minutes at the moment great shot of james there once to remember <laughs> looking down at this crowd whole arena watching him looks like he's having a great time
into the final head wall then old 53 is under the roof this is good work from James top here would be absolutely fantastic but definitely ramped up in the last couple of moves still making those mini shakeouts while trying to get this clip in as well um, this is the last quick draw so there is quite a big gap between this one and the final chain but it will mean he doesn't have to stop and think about clipping he can well hopefully keep climbing all the way through just a couple of crimps now three holds before the big move to the top he does look absolutely boxed at this stage can he fight it out but it's up he can't but it's a great effort from James Pollard he'll go through head and shoulders above Nigel Leeming and John Banyard at this stage in the semi-final round great effort from James good day all rounds hopefully he'll be able to recover ready for tomorrow oh, really solid climbing from James there and yeah having already done two routes today and claiming to be a boulder I so he's probably up to his climbing move count by maybe 10 times in yeah. a day we've heard it all before it's not really a boulder I mean. most boulders can only get to the third quick draw on to the men's semi-final then one climber out on the wall to begin with then we're going to be side by side with the women it's Konstantin Lukin is going to be going on the wall first so we've got 13 men 12 women and we start on the right hand side of this main competition wall so this is his first British League Climbing Championships and he has said that he's already very happy to be in semis so pretty relaxed going into this and just looking to see how he gets on really nice positive attitude I think yeah really hard to actually climb in a relaxed manner when you've got so many faces and eyes on you all eyes in the arena currently now on Constantine did you ever find that affected your climbing, Hannah, from day-to-day -day tri training, climbing, and when you're on the big show, all eyes on you, does it change your ability on the wall in any way, did you find? Um, I thought I actually climbed better with the crowd pressure. Um, I really enjoyed it. I always thought of it as um, sort of not so much pressure, but actually just excitement. Um, and I know a lot of the climbers in the semi-final are the same. I think that's why they love competitions, because they like putting themselves in that position. Um, and certainly to be in this arena with this size of a crowd and be on this iconic competition wall that World Cups are hosted on is a pretty cool experience. So I'd like to think that everyone in the semi-final will see it as an enjoyable experience. So currently left hand on hold number 12. 49 would be the top. Past the big hinge feature here at the Raffo wall. This wall can actually articulate in different directions, more or less overhanging. It's a nice flowy start here from Constantin. He has spoken about how he's really happy with how being a complete outsider to the competition scene he's come in and everyone in this environment is so friendly. Um, he's obviously qualified um, in the lowest position, which means he can't really lose anything here. He just has to go on and give it a bash, see how he gets on. And clearly he's found that the other competitors are really supportive. And yeah, he seems to be saying that he's having a really good time at the British League Climbing Championships. And what is great is being down from the London-based walls. He says he regularly climbs at the Hang in Hounslow in London. It's great to see him all the way up here in Edinburgh getting stuck in. Just struggling with this foot swap a little bit. Pretty awkward looking move. He seems to be quite tall and have quite long legs, so struggling to yeah. bring the right body position in there. Potentially using a slightly different beta there from what the route said is intended. Rather than going immediately out left and flipping to the right hand, he went into the right hand undercut initially, so it made it quite hard for himself there. It's about halfway up this competition wall at the moment, and we're moving from these orange holes into these black slopers which are slightly in cut but um, not the most positive things in the world especially at that angle yeah there is a small black foothold out there that Rich says so you can in theory get a knee bar there he does just drop it in it's quite a sharp knee bar fairly shallow the sort of edge of the volume does dig into the, the flesh of the knee slightly but he has found it so he's obviously looks like he's getting something back from it as well which is always always nice Yeah, halfway up the wall, utilising that rest, exactly how the route set is predicted. Up in 
20. Oh, 27 now. Three minutes 30 used out of his six minutes. Went for the big oh. smash up left hand to hold 29. That was a really good effort from Constantine there. It got over halfway up the wall, which is amazing. And those volumes are all really bad and they're joined together to only have a little edge available for the climber to hold. So really solid effort by him there. And I hope he enjoyed it. Yeah, I think you can walk away from this competition. Chances are that score probably won't at this stage put him into the top six. Um, obviously, there's a fairly long amount of climbing still ahead of us, um, but he'd go away pretty happy with that, I would say. Next climber out, we'll be side by side. First female senior climber, Ruth Hardy, will be alongside Rees Hall. We'll be back on the same route as we saw Constantine on. Ruth Hardy will be on the left hand side. Ruth got a bit of a fan club in the in the venue Plenty here. Plenty of whoops there. That's what. So we go picture in picture now. See both climbers climbing at the same time. We we'll do our best to keep an eye on both. Looking forward to seeing our first climber on this women's route as well. The women's route looks very different to the men's route. Um, definitely a lot more um, big slopey holds on triangular volumes as well. Looks very interesting. I'm keen to see how Ruth works it out. So the route setting team will have to work through the night tonight to change these routes, strip all these holds down and put the finals back on for the start of tomorrow morning. That is the 10 a.m. finals tomorrow. Do hope you can join us. Ruth looking confident through this lower section. Yeah, she's climbing quite quickly with a good sense of purpose, I would say. Um, she's moving confidently, looks happy on the wall, um, definitely seems to have her sights set on getting quite high on this route, which is cool to see. Reese said this is also his first British League Climbing Championship, so he'll be really happy to be climbing in the semi final. Um, again, has said happy to be in the semis but let's see what happens so he's not ruling out him doing well at all and nor should he um, leaving the doors open there psychologi <laughs> psychologically Reeves just using a little bit of power through that transition from the black holds into this orange section as Ruth still showing fair bit of power as she moves into this really big featured tap section but her right arm is clearly starting to tire as she moves into the undercut a really good effort holding that from Ruth yeah that was a hundred percent effort just desperately clinging onto that undercut the route set to say that did say that it is a hard move to get established into the undercut really looks a bit powered out here Full battle mode engaged. And we Best just ball. lose Reese as well, just fumbling that little black crimp under that orange pinch. So we are looking to get this group of 12 women and 13 men down to six for tomorrow's final. So we'll keep an eye on the scores as we go along through this round over the next hour or so have just joined us. We, you have missed the speed finals already. It was a, it was a bit of a classic actually. We do go back and tune into that. The British Junior and Senior Speed Finals.
Ruth looks pretty happy with the climbing, have to say. Um, I think she'll be pretty pleased with that. Again, halfway up the wall, pretty iconic wall as well. So definitely walking away pleased with herself, I reckon. I reckon she will use that, hopefully go back home, reflect on the experience and adjust her training, think about next year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everyone has to have their first time in a semi-final or a final and you're better off just looking at it as, the, as what it is and saying, look, a lot of the people in this final with me are a lot more experienced than I am and therefore I should just use this as an experience. And yeah, she looked like she was having a great time. She fought really hard and it was a really solid effort and she should be super proud. Out next then we have Connie Rawlins in the women's category on the left and we have Ewan Lewins joining us on the men's route. Connie wearing number four on the back of her jersey. Ewan 33. You can see how massive that wall is from that previous camera shot. Ewan is from Inverness so further north than here by quite a long way and um, he's traveled quite far to be here today we'll be pretty happy as said what he wanted to achieve this weekend was semi-finals so he can just climb to see how he gets on in this training facilities up in Inverness they've just opened a brand new facility actually called the ledge and um, I think Inverness has been hoping for a new training center for quite some time so they'll be really happy with that although Ewan's actually just gone off to medical school in Dundee perfect timing <laughs> Hopefully there's some decent facilities there as well for him to keep this training up. It's so good to get through to the semi-final round. Connie I know pretty well as well. She's at university with me in Edinburgh. Um, and yeah, she's been training for this event uh, for quite some time. So I reckon she's, she's gunning for a place in finals if she can here. And yeah, climbing fairly quickly through the start, showing a lot of potential to get quite high on this route. Connie taking a nice rest there. I do think that it's important to rest low down on this wall. It is a long way to go. And if you can stay relaxed from low down onwards, you definitely um, manage to stay fresh for as long as you possibly can. Um, and certainly with some bad holds coming up on this women's route a bit later on, uh, worthwhile doing. You are not particularly enjoying the transition from the black and yellow holds into the orange section. This is the sequence that we've Expected a little bit more from the route set as that flip into the right hand does just about stick it, but he's clearly trying quite hard to transition to that orange section initially. Let's see if he can recover a little bit through this next section. Clearly, a very hard route right from the get go here. Very competitive field as we look at this undercut move on the left hand side. See if he notices this knee bar coming up. Really good save from you in there. Only looking quite comfortable in the undercut as we do just lose Ewan. Yeah, definitely started to look a little bit tired there, Ewan. Didn't have the power left, but a really solid effort nonetheless. Yeah, I think it's quite clear that that upper undercut section of the uh, orange bit on the wall there in the men's route, clearly where the route really starts to kick in. Just losing Connie after that powerful undercut move again there as well. The route setter is definitely pushing the climbers quite early on in this route, which is really cool to see, but definitely makes for a bit of a tough time if you're the competitor. Yeah, as what would normally happen in a situation, the route setters tend to really ramp up the level for the semi-final round compared to the qualifiers, just to make sure that they get a real test and split the field ready for the finals. There were quite a few tops in the qualification round as well in the men's and the women's event, so they'll be aware of that and definitely trying to split these climbers going into the final round. You can actually see the qualifying routes that got top. This pink one was a male qualifier, had six tops, and the green one to the left of the wall um, had four from the women's. So Katie Fisher joins us out next, wearing number three. Tom Healy wearing 31 on the men's route. Both of these climbers travelled a long way to get here, Katie being from Norwich. Very long way, I have to say, I travelled there myself. It wasn't a journey I'd recommend. And Tom being from North Wales. Yeah, Katie, we see her a lot on the bouldering competitions. 
uh, down in the southeast. I've seen her training lead uh, at the Castle Climbing Centre in London as well. Surprising lack of lead walls in the southeast. There's a, there's a few, some really good ones as well, but um, generally speaking, not huge overhanging lead walls like we see here at Raffo. No, I think we are definitely very lucky here in Edinburgh to have this facility. It's one of the best in the country. And um, yeah, our climbers definitely make the most of its amazing holds and angles. And certainly it shows, I think, when they come to competitions like this and their endurance is off the scales. It's really impressive. Tom's local climbing wall is the Beacon Climbing Centre in North Wales also had the British Championships there a few years ago, so he'll be aware of this competition and has entered a few times, so hopefully that experience will show on this route. Let's see how Tom Healy gets on moving out of this yellow and black section into the orange side pulls and undercuts. He's just moving up level with Katie at the moment, side by side on the wall. It's kind of an old school crossover sequence here for Katie Fish now, the cross Cross over or cross under, depending on preference. As the guy's got this sort of slightly tricky move into the right hand undercut. Tom does make it stick. undercut move now here for Katie. Can she battle through and establish up into this undercut? She cannot. Feels like you've really got to move up into that undercut with, with, with full confidence, the power up into it and then take the rest. Yeah, that was unlucky from Katie. We saw her trying to weight her foot a lot and get a little bit of energy back, but I do think that that undercut move really requires a lot of conviction from the climber to be sure they're going to get it and really go into it um, with confidence, as you say. And I think, unfortunately, that's what Katie just lacks, getting into that hold. So it's just Tom Healy on his own up on the wall at the moment as he starts to work his way through this next section and back into the yellow volumes. We have seen Constantine up here. He's covered a 28 plus, which is the next move. Oh, good battle. Oh, that was really good effort from Tom. Very similar score as well for Tom. Just as we get into the next rotation, really pleased to bring one of our route setting teams, Zoe, into the commentary position. Zoe, it's obviously early days in this semi-final, but it's been a long week for you and the team. Yeah, yeah, we've been here since since Tuesday now, so yeah, definitely feels like second home. <laughs> second home, but overall you're happy with the qualifiers this morning and start the semi-finals? Yeah, 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 we're off to a smooth start. Um, I'm kind of, I just focused on the women's routes, um, so from my point of view, we got a split from the qualifier and so far, yeah, people are, people are, and people are, it's nice to see like lots of climbing getting done as well, you know, not, not, not just a split and it being low down, like we want to see people like coming all the way to Scotland, but also getting to get a lot of moves in. So the next climbers out, Cameron McLean in the men's and Louise Flockhart, Louise, who we've just seen on the speed finals as well. So. She's had a pretty big day out so far already. Do you have to factor that in at all into the route setting? Can you can you get down to the minutiae of that at all? With she's obviously done qualifiers in lead, and now she's done speed, and now she's back to semi-finals in lead. Um, we kind of you know we don't we don't think about it too much um, here at Ratho. Like it's kind of expected that if you, if you're at that top level, you probably are going to end up doing a lot of climbing, especially with with the semi-finals thrown in as well now. And in the women's route, you've got this undercut section, big yellow dual texture undercut right in the middle of the wall around move number 22. You've got sort of 44 moves, so it's about halfway on the on the route exactly. And we're seeing quite a few people drop there. Did you expect that to be a hard sequence? Yeah, that's certainly where um, kind of, uh, like from our point of view, we're like, right, this is the move that starts the building of, uh, of the harder moves. Um, kind of, it is, it is turned up a notch in terms of burl. You just have to commit to standing on your feet and almost get that transition done like as quickly as you can. And 
as these climbers progress you just like to see you got here on Tuesday did you start with the qualifiers finals semi-finals no so yeah we started on final with finals basically did a round a day working working backwards um, and then based off how the competitors competitors do we do a little bit of tweaks between rounds as well so we, we, we put up a harder version and then know the easier tweaks as well kind of give us a bit of wiggle room and is this your first british league championship setting no i uh, i set the lead last year as well yeah nice. so you're having a good year british bowling championships now onto the leads yeah yeah it's going well yeah it's super exciting yeah just as we see here, we see Louise moving into this section of the undercut that we were just talking about, oh, trying, wow. trying something a little bit different there, just exploring the underside of that hold. Yeah. As Cameron is just working his way nicely through this orange section at the moment. There's the undercut move, yeah, yeah. Nice. with confidence. Yeah, That's what yeah. we were talking about with Hannah a second ago as well. Just you need to move into that undercut with, with an, a level of confidence and experience to know that you just need to stand up into yeah. it. Get, get those kind of things done over as quickly as possible and then stand up and have a little shake. And then the men's category, there's this right-hand knee bar that we saw the first yeah. climber out, Constantin, using a little bit. Doesn't yeah. look like um, Cameron's found it just no, yet. No, no, I think it does make a good difference for that shake if you do find it, it's fairly good. High point here in the women's category as well from Louise, nice. who's obviously gone, gone well through the speed competition, has got plenty left in the tank. <laughs> I guess you'll be riding that buzz as well. That'll, that'll definitely be be uh, keeping her going. Nice. Really good work here from Cameron as well into a new high point. Dropping that right toe hook in straight away through there, moving with confidence still. Looks like a fairly okay rest as well. Climbers actually right side by side here. Yeah, they're doing a, doing a great job of uh, keeping in, in eye line for both of them. Battle mode really commencing here for yeah. Cameron, especially oh. as he does drop. And for Louise. Louise pushing on really nice now into yeah. hold 32. 33 is out left, really in battle mode, yeah. is fully engaged here. Oh. And a great work for Louise Flockhart. Getting close to hold 34 there. Yeah, she did a great job on that. Good work for Louise, good work for Cameron. And thank you so much, Zoe, for joining me in the commentary position. Hopefully, we'll see you tomorrow morning. A long night ahead, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got to strip these and put finals up and maybe make some tweaks. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> make sure you've got, you. got the coffees ready to go. <laughs> Thank you. Our next climbers out, Robert Cook is going to be joining us in the men's competition and Willow Petrobelli will be joining us on the left-hand side. Willow a little bit disappointed, I would say, after the qualifying round as she, as she came off the wall. Yeah, she didn't seem happy. I spoke to her after qualifiers and, yeah, seemed pretty frustrated. Um, mistakes on both routes and, yeah, I think she's hoping for a lot more in this semi-final. But as I said to her at the time, at least she's got a chance to show it in the semi yeah, in some ways, this British Championships is competitive, but it's also an, a perfect place to gain some experience for those bigger events when it really does count. No, definitely. I think Willow is an experienced climber. Um, she's done a lot of youth events, but it's just starting to break into senior competitions now. Uh, the same Rob. Rob competed a lot um, as a youth climber and is just breaking onto the senior scene now. Um, so these climbers definitely know what they're doing. Just this is a new level for them, really. Actually, uh, Root Set and organised the Blockfest series down in the southeast of England, and Willow Petrobelli won a number of rounds there uh, during last winter. Predominantly a lead climber, but clearly not too shabby on the bouldering wall as well.
Both of these climbers have said that they would like to achieve finals at this event. Um, and so, yeah, I think we're starting to break into the climbers that have really high hopes for this competition. Yeah, we're really uh, starting now. to get into the sort of the top end, the business end of this draw. I think we will start to see the emotions change. You see people falling down early. People who really want this. Rob looking pretty comfortable moving into the orange section on the right hand side. This Willow seems to have a real laser focus so far on this route. Both of them starting to come into these tricky sections now where we've lost a lot of good climbers, so it'll be interesting to see how they handle these. Yeah, really nicely there. Didn't seem too tricky in the end from Willow. Moved with sort of flow and ease through up into hole 22 into that undercut. seeming to look for that knee bar. He is one of the taller climbers. He's six foot. Um, so maybe not seeing it as, oh, might be seeing it now. Yeah, interestingly, the sequence does go up right hand in terms of scoring right hand then down left. The root sets did suggest that being one of the taller guys, he might be able to go down left. He does stick to the original method. Starting to really need some power. Drop a gear through that middle section. It does fall. Good effort from Rob. Uh, I've lost a couple of climbers there now. Definitely starting to emerge as a, a crux move. Willow up into hold 30. 31 is for the match. Still really moving nicely here. Great right hand, uh, right foot heel hook there. No, Willow looks really good on this route. Definitely looks calm, composed. Trying really hard now though. That's hold 34 now. Support starts to ramp up now for Willow, and you can see she's starting to rush the quick draws. Pump clearly kicking in on the left hand. Misses the draw once, that's going to hurt her, her chances a little. She's coming into this really big angle change now, and just didn't have enough left in the tank. Yeah, that should be a 36 plus for yeah. Willow. A couple of moves above the previous high point, so it's going to be interesting as we get into the top six athletes now, seven that's going to be enough to get her through into the top. It's going to be really touch and go on those fringe positions. Looking to get six through to tomorrow's final. Well, you can definitely see during that angle change um, into that roof, the climbing does ramp up a lot. I reckon Willow might have had another move or so in her had she have not fumbled that clip, which definitely took a lot out of her, but a really solid climb from her, nonetheless. Did see her at the end there also looking around to sort of gauge from maybe friends or family at how that was. Sometimes for the climbers it is hard to tell, especially if they've come out earlier. Um, but no, she should definitely be really happy with that solid climb. Yeah, as Willow literally walks straight past our commentary position here, a fan club right in front of us, trying to let her know what's going on. But even for us in the commentary position, it's hard to know at this stage if that is going to be enough. Out next, Emma Futcher and Finley Kerswell. Both of these climbers, super experienced, have done a lot of youth comps. Um, Finn is still very young himself, he's youth A, um, which means he is eligible still to compete in junior categories, but has chosen to come to the senior event. Um, I want to say this is his first senior British League Climbing Championships. Um, Testing your knowledge now. No, I'm right, he has said he'd never entered the BLCCs before. Um, so yeah, this will be a great experience for him to be competing against all of the senior athletes, and yeah, I think he can hold his own as well, so we'll see how he gets on. Emma, also a really strong climber, has competed in youth international events before. Um, very slow and controlled in her style. Um, so this route could suit her. Um, but yeah, she could do with climbing pretty quickly, I reckon, through it though, because it gets pretty powerful, I reckon. 
Yeah, as we've seen, the power sections really do seem to start ramping up after the halfway point on the route. Finley, one of those younger generation climbers who seems to be good at both bouldering and lead. I've seen him in bouldering finals at local levels. Really travelling around for the events as well, which is great to see. Now, Finn's from Exeter, so massive commitment for him to be up here. I was talking to him earlier about his experience on the train, where he said he had to stand for some of the way, and I've definitely been there before. It's not pleasant. But yeah, it just shows the commitment of some of these athletes. Emma is also from, uh, well, she's at University in Nottingham, but is originally from near London. So, yeah, again, big commitment, a lot of travel. Um, and, yeah, I do wonder if it plays on their mind sometimes in competitions with the amount of pressure but they all handle it really well. Yeah, we do see it on the international circuit quite a lot with the athletes really fatiguing towards the end of the season with all of the travel. It's Finley just investigates that next hold up and does opt to use the no knee bar. No hands rest on handy. the knee bar. Yeah. <laughs> crowd like that one. Well, he's a crowd pleaser, Finn. Always has been. <laughs> a really powerful move back out left, though, straight out of that rest. Emma moving really steadily through this route and actually quite quickly as well. Um, she's looking really good so far. Finley looking comfortable but starting to show a few signs of fatigue. The head just tilting back a little bit as he pushed through up into that black left hand volume and then again into that undercut. Really powerful section this but it is Finn's strength so um, fingers crossed he can get quite a few more moves in. I think that his next few moves should suit him. Working really hard and still plenty of time left on the clock, both of these climbers. As Finley goes again for his right hand, that's hold 36, 49 is the top. Emma looking, looking pretty relaxed still as well, but it's definitely about to start ramping up. Oh, unlucky, just missed that hold. Losing both climbers, but very high on the wall as well. Yeah, this is going to be a really interesting semi-final round now. It is going to come through to the top third of these routes as we get to see who's going to make that top six cut off. Pleased to be joined in the commentary position by ex-British team climbing legends and route setter here, Dave Barons. Dave, uh, looks like a really interesting semi-final. It's going to come down to the top third of these routes in both categories. Yeah, hopefully that's what we're aiming for. Yeah, hopefully that's what we're aiming for. Um, the bottoms may be a little bit easier than the qualifier they had earlier, but it builds quite a lot more. The route's quite a bit harder. So. But it makes it interesting from the viewing audience perspective as well to, to see people high up on this immense feature here. What is it like to root set on this, this type of wall? Oh, it goes on forever. <laughs> <laughs> you're, Says a you're, set, you're setting away and then you, you look up and realise you're only halfway at the wall and it's like, oh, <laughs> keep going then. And you must have competed on this wall a number of times. Yeah, I think I, I, think I won nationals here, actually. Um, about halfway, I think. <laughs> Out next. We have Hannah Kerr joining us in the women's category and Ben Preston wearing number 39 joining us on the right. And Dave, you've been, you've been competing for many a years, um, won a lot of competitions. Um, do you miss being back on the circuit at all? I, to a certain extent, yeah, but also I get to be part of it as a bootsetter as well, which is a really nice. It's a different, uh, different thing, but it's a different reward, I guess, is like watching kind of people go up your creation and watching people struggle on your people creation struggle or people figure things out is a nice thing definitely what we're we looking for then in the top sections of this route it seems these routes do seem to build really quite nicely but then that that head wall looks savagely steep yeah that roof really kicks in at you 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 might think you're all right and you pull into that roof and all of a sudden all the energy's gone out of your arms and you're like you're gassing pretty quickly especially with the clips like they kind of dangle in the wrong places and do you factor in the, the actual clipping of the clips when you're when you're root setting or just let them figure it out for themselves? 
A little bit. You have to think about it a little bit. Like um, certainly the almost moves in themselves on these routes now. Like we tend to put the clips in quite often slightly awkward places. You'll be in a powerful position or kind of crossing under yourself to put the clip in. That's what we always found with these competition style routes. It's never usually two good holes next to each other where you can rest. There's always sort of elements of stress involved uh, throughout the route. Yeah, we try and take out the kind of two good holes next to each other because it just takes out the shakes. So, Hannah Kerr on the left hand side then looking okay at the moment. This kind of old school cross under move. A little bit of power required. Hannah was absolutely epic in the qualifying round second route earlier today. And Ben Preston won somebody who's got really back into the competition circuit, trying to re-establish themselves as one of the big contenders. Nice work there from Hannah, though, into that undercut yeah. section around half 22. That's the first kind of real move on the route. is a bit uncomfortable. You just have to stand into it hard. Yeah, we've seen um, climbers such as Willow out a minute ago. And um, with, uh, Louise, excuse me, really kind of moving a little bit more smoothly, showing that a little bit of confidence moving into that undercut. Yeah, it's that classic comp move. If you commit and stand into it, it's fine. But if you don't, then it can feel like the hardest move in the world. Hannah starting to look a little bit tired. Big cr uh, cut loose there for a second. Yeah, a real sustained section here. Like, just keeps coming at you. And the knee bar on the men's route that Ben Preston is just about to potentially move into. Do you, is it particularly obvious for the for the climbers, do you think? Um, if they're looking for it, it doesn't look like he wants it, but... <laughs> ben Preston's coach back home, Ben Reed. Did suggest that I would give him a shout out. So, hi Ben, if you're watching, and it does opt to go straight out left. An interesting sequence. So it looks like he's a bit too spanned out for that. It does score by going up right first and then back down and left. As Hannah pushes really high up into the upper sections here, she's into the top third of the route now and working really hard, but clearly looking fairly boxed as he tries to find that cheeky little right foot. Both climbers still going pretty well over here, but Hannah clearly putting in a huge battle. Yeah, Hannah's starting to fight now. Ben still looks pretty relaxed, actually. Like, a lot of moves to go, though. There's some hard moves coming up. Long way to go, that's for sure. That's what this wall keeps offering. As we look for potentially a new high point here. Brilliant work from Hannah. Good work, and it's going to get really close around that area of the route. That's a, Round hole 36, sort of that sort of area. We've already seen uh, Willow up there as well. So time will tell. Dave, thank you so much. Um, I'll let you stress out for the next half an hour or so as we try and get those climbers down to the six ready for tomorrow's final. Thanks, Mike. So Hannah Smith joining me back in the commentary book. Uh, Hannah into the top five athletes now, so it starts to get a bit more stressful. Definitely, and these climbers will be somewhat aware of how high people are getting. Well, one, the quick draws are swinging, so it's a little bit of a giveaway if they decide to look up and notice that. Some climbers choose not to pay attention to that, if possible. Um, but also they've been waiting quite a long time to come out, so they'll know the climber before them probably got quite high, certainly wasn't falling off near the ground. Um, and they can also gauge from the crowd usually as well, so there are a few giveaways, but these guys will definitely be aware that they have to do some work here. So that work is for Sam Butterworth joining us the men's competition, and somebody who always likes to see, grew up in my neck of the woods down in London, Joe Neem. Good to see Joe competing again. Looks pretty solid in the qualifiers. Let's see how she gets on on this route. Well used to climbing on these big stages. Has competed for Team GB a number of times, especially in the lead. Sam on the British team this year has some really good results. Um, this past year, I think he was 13th in a European Cup. Um, so yeah, definitely an experienced lead climber and we'll be hoping to do well this weekend. So 
we are becoming quite familiar now with these lower sections of the routes. For us, we know, we've seen other competitors come before, Joe and Sam, but for these guys, the observation period, as Hannah was saying, was quite a long time ago now, so really got to dig deep into the memory bank and try and flow through these early sections, knowing that they are going to have to get quite high up on the wall. Yeah, it's so important for these climbers to start off well on these routes, get into a good flow, good rhythm, and also get their own confidence up as they move through the route. Um, both these climbers seem to be doing that really well. I think if they'd been stumbling on the first few clips, they maybe would have lost a bit of confidence, but both moving fast and really efficiently. Interestingly, Jonine looking around already. I think she's probably trying to spot the clock if she's thinking about that at this stage. Obviously, she's got a lot, a lot of time left on the, on the clock at the moment, but she may not have spotted it before she leaves the ground. I'm not actually 100% sure where it is on the arena floor. Sam not looking entirely comfortable moving through the end of that black and yellow volume section. Hopefully he can regain a little bit of composure through this next bit. Looks like he has found a half decent rest there. Finding a rest on a route can be a really good way of relaxing, recomposing yourself. And yeah, Sam seems to be making use of this one. Another climber who's both strong on the boulders and the lead. Well at the British Bouldering Championships in Sheffield earlier this summer. Yeah, Sam was second in the BBC, so really strong effort. Um, and says that his strength in climbing is one arm pull-ups. Not sure if that will pay dividends yeah, on this route, but... I don't think that's going to help on this one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unless you get, want to do a showboat on the last move, I'll, I'll pay money to see that, but let's see. Joe looking super composed, that's her style. And quite a slow climber, maximum endurance. Sam does opt for that knee bar on the right-hand side. We saw Finley taking a no-hands rest there, just very briefly. It is a half decent rock over. Can Joni go with confidence into this undercut then? Yeah, out she looked right pretty and... solid on that undercut move. Yeah, she moved off to the right and really rocked up into it. Oh, it's for the inside flag, not a move we see very often, I don't think, in competition climbing. The lesser seen inside flag. Looking a little bit hesitant on this section where you said the route setter is intended for climbers to go right hand first and then down with the left. Yeah, he's really got himself in a bit of a situation here. He's going to have to pull really hard to get through this. He's going to have to do a big smash up right. Hits it. Recovers, but yeah, that will probably cost him because going right hand never looks that um, intense for the climbers, whereas that looked hard. Putting weight on his heels though and trying to relax again, getting that crossover move. Clearly the atmosphere here demonstrates the pressure that is mounting on these athletes. They are in the top five currently. It's top six scores here in this semi-final round that do go through to tomorrow morning's final. Absolute side by side on the wall at the moment. Sam really trying to get something back. That sort of toe hook rest does seem to be working. Left foot just splatted on top of a very slippery dual texture volume for his left foot there. Joe looking pretty relaxed as well. She's taking quite a long rest here. Um, can be a sign that she's got quite a lot, le a lot left in the tank. Um, so yeah, I'm keen to see what she can do getting through this roof. Yeah, this style at the moment does seem to be suiting her, but the, the, sort of the real power sections do ramp up in this next couple of moves as the holds turn from sort of more in cuts and crimps into slopers and pinches as Sam pushes for a potential new high point here. You know, this is where we're starting to see the get guys getting to now in this upper end of this semi-final round. Really dropping down quite low here, Sam. Trying to find a rest. He's going to have to sort of scramble his way back up. He is using a really nice sort of left toe hook to rest as Jonine enters full battle mode now. Just getting herself in a little bit of a tangle. Wanted to go with the heel hook in, but I'm not sure she can. Fighting through with the left hand instead. Yeah, really good fight there from Joe. Up into hole 30, close to 37. So it's probably a 36 plus potentially for Joe. 
And if it is a 36 plus, then we will see both of those climbers in finals tomorrow, as there are only four, five climbers, four climbers left to climb four in climbers each category. Go, yeah. So they are both through. Yeah, it's getting closer around that whole 36, 36 plus. A plus is awarded to the climbers if they make progression past the previous hold into the next hold. So between hold 36 and 37, if you move between them, you get the plus. out onto the stage and into the top four a face that we've seen many times at the British lead and bordering championships and on the international circuit Jen Wood Jen competing for so many years now really always there or thereabouts and Diane Actor one of those kind of new breed of super strong boulderers yeah Dan, Dan definitely um, sees himself as a boulder so lead isn't necessarily his comfort zone but that doesn't mean he can't be competitive here today. He definitely put in a really good effort in qualifiers, qualified pretty high up. So we'll see how he gets on. Do you feel like as competition climbing evolves, the Olympics now has a huge part of how athletes train and what they look forward to? It's a combined event now at the Olympics with lead and boulder combined that you feel like the new, new breed of younger athletes, we don't really see single discipline specialists anymore. It's definitely um, a consideration for a lot of younger climbers. I would say most of them do have a specialism, and Dan certainly, I think, would opt to do boulder over lead any day. But certainly, they can be competitive across both disciplines. I know a lot of the youth climbers um, do competitions in both, um, which isn't necessarily as common as it um, was a few years ago. I think people are starting to specialize more so that they can actually get good results in their individual discipline and then also keeping the other ones sort of tagging along so that it's there when they need to pull it out if they do go to start aiming for the Olympics. Also, um, the, the, the individual disciplines can complement each other as well to a certain degree. Absolutely. I think a lot of the boulders, like Dan, are really strong on lead, especially given, given that the routes are getting more powerful. A lot of them have dynamic elements to them these days, and Dan is certainly not to be discounted when it comes to a jump or a big slopey hold. Um, so yeah, I do think there is starting to become a lot more crossover in the disciplines for sure. So we're quite familiar with these sections now as Diane moves into that right hand undercut move, looking very composed at the moment as is Jen Wood. Really great performance previously out for Joe Neem, I've just seen her walk past our commentary position. Smiling ear to ear, very happy with that, really to pull out a fine performance, it's, it's great from Joe. Jen looking pretty relaxed, she looked really solid in qualifiers and um, I think she'll get pretty high on this route, it'll be really good to see and she's definitely one of the more experienced climbers here so head game, definitely a specialty for her and um, I think a lot of us grew up watching Jen do senior competitions so she's definitely a cool person to climb in competitions with and always super friendly to the younger and less experienced athletes as well. that sort of tricky cut loose move there for Dan seems to be quite comfortable that bouldering strength that Anna mentioned really kind of coming good there as Jen just slight fatigue showing in the right hand as she curls the fingers around that crimp that's screwed onto the uh, big yellow hole that she's got a right hand on interesting rest position here not sure if the resetters would have seen that straight away as a as a really good rest matching hole matching hand standing on the dual texture with the right foot hooking rounds. I do think that uh, that is Dan's boulder side showing a little bit more there. He's quite comfortable on big holds, standing on things that aren't great. Um, definitely don't see standing on dual techs and roots as much, but certainly it's becoming fairly common in bouldering, so probably well within his comfort zone. Both climbers starting to look pretty tired now, both taking micro shakes whenever they can. 
is where this men's route really starts to get quite interesting. We've not seen many guys up here now finding that right foot. This is good from Diane. Big move now. Huge sloping volume. That high up in the roof looks absolutely savage, that move. Great work from Diane. Should, really good try hard effort from him there. Yeah, that'll be enough. As Jen Wood now pushes into this upper third. Good work not from got this clip in yet that we saw Willow struggling with earlier in the final. Well, amazing to stick that right hand full confidence. Knew that getting the clip might fatigue her. And it proved that she did quite smart thing there, really jumping for the next hold, knowing that she was pretty much completely out of gas. It'll be interesting to see if she gets given that hold, actually, because there are rules around you will only get given the hold from where you could last do the clip so the root setters will have to judge whether or not Jen will have been able to reach the clip from that hold they may say no they may say yes um, uncertain but certainly that will be up for debate definitely yeah I think I would if I was a judge which I have been before I would go for yes that's okay on that one um, but yeah the, the, the judging team very experienced here they will they will drop down have a little chat with the root setters and decide if that clipping position was possible even if she only gets given the plus, she would still qualify for tomorrow's final. Yeah, good work from Jen, showing that, that experience once again. Into the top three competitors now, coming to the tail end of this semi-final round here, live from Raffo in Edinburgh. Raffo, Europe's largest climbing centre. And tackling this monstrous competition wall in front of us, it's going to be Erin McNeese and somebody called Daniel Smith, <laughs> Hannah's brother. If we go quiet over the next few minutes, I fully understand why. Joy of getting to watch your sibling climb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, Erin is probably a favourite to win this competition. She's one of our most experienced competition climbers in the UK, has been on the World Cup circuit this year. Um, yeah, definitely one to watch. Yeah, but also has lots of pressure on her shoulders. Definitely. I think Erin comes into this competition in a different mindset to a lot of the rest of them. Um, she's almost got a target on her back as the one to beat, so she really has to focus on herself, um, trying to win, get the results she wants. Um, yeah, but can't, yeah, can't different position. Can't be easy position. at that age either. Uh, either. A super young competitor, obviously she's got a fair bit of international experience now, but it's still not an easy position to be in. Yeah, she is only 19. She's really still quite young and has a lot of um, time left to grow in her own climbing. But yeah, certainly making great headway for her age. Bit of background about Daniel. Daniel's from Glasgow, but this is his local um, lead training facility. He is studying at the University of Edinburgh at the moment, so comes here fairly regularly, um, although has spent the summer training in Sheffield at the schoolroom. He is one of the taller climbers, which does affect him a little bit. He is six foot two, um, but has always learned to climb wh while using his height and can certainly be an advantage to him, but definitely something he has to manage and quite often has to climb routes differently to other competitors, which we might see in this route. Yeah, it can be a blessing and a curse. Depending on the, the, the move and the route set, Erin got herself into a bit of a knot here as well, which is not great. Yeah, Wait. just a slight uh, route reading error from Erin, which you wouldn't actually expect. I'm surprised at that. Hopefully that doesn't start to play on her mindset as she goes through this next section. Hopefully she can just draw a line under that and, and push on. So we've got a nice body position there, Erin, to try and get a little bit of a rest on the right arm, but just not quite understanding this next undercut move into hold 22. Totally different method here from Erin. Wow, really good effort from her there, working that out. Almost seemed like she didn't want to commit to that undercut move in the same way that everybody else has, 
I do wonder if that's maybe that pressure that we were talking about earlier with her being a favourite. She really doesn't want to mess up low down on a route and is maybe focusing on not taking risks more than other climbers who are willing to take a few risks to see how they can get on on the route. Erin knows that she is capable of doing really well, therefore wants to sort of protect that, so to speak. Yeah, that's the different pressure that we're talking about. Daniel looking pretty solid so far on the route. Nothing really of concern, just really working his way through the gears as he works his way past the halfway point on this route. Uh, Daniel's quite a steady climber, does like to take his time. Um, you can usually tell when he starts trying hard because the back of his neck goes red. <laughs> that's how I tell when he's trying hard anyway. As uh, Daniel's sibling, I think that's absolutely fine to say. <laughs> The try-hard redneck, not engaged yet from Daniel. Tunes ramp up here at Raffo. Atmosphere really building as we want to see climbers pushing towards the head, head wall here. Really nice here from Daniel Smith, looking really solid. This is where we saw Diane spill in the last couple of minutes. Really crimping down on that left-hand screw-on that's on the back of the volume. First climber into the undercut here. This is good work from Daniel. Really powering through this upper section, does well to release the leg from out the back of the rope and that will be plenty for Daniel Smith and a really good target for the other climbers going into tomorrow's final. And you can breathe. <laughs> <laughs> no, he'll be super happy with that. Um, he's put a lot of work into his lead climbing this year. It's been really good for me to see how hard he's been training and yeah, I think the way he looked composed and happy on that route, he'll be really pleased. And it means when you're all sat around the dinner table tonight, you can talk about something positive rather than sort of all looking at your <laughs> shoelaces. Yeah, definitely. Erin took quite a long rest while Daniel was climbing there. She's definitely taking her time up this route, um, making the most of every opportunity she gets. She does look pretty composed still. Definitely has something left in the tank. See if she works out this clip. Yeah, these pinches really do seem to start sucking the life out of the forearms pretty quickly Erin really fighting now this is a really interesting move going up and again with the left hands not immediately obvious to read that's a good snare there from Erin holds it and shows immense contact strength taking that swing will she bother with a clip or will she move on does just go for it a really good effort from Erin there that move looks really difficult that heel hook really difficult to get into that hold actually the hold's not exactly facing the ideal way um, but yeah I think she'll be pretty happy with yeah, that we, we're just getting into the weeds of the scoring whether she'll be given the plus there past hold 37 because that might be going beyond the clipping position as Hannah suggested before but we'll let the judges work that one out as we only have two climbers left in the men's two in the women's really bunched the, uh, the, the top end of the women's competition here yeah. Two free climbers around 36, 36 plus. Now a couple around 37. It's going to be a tight one. Definitely going to be a tight competition in tomorrow's final. There are a lot of climbers with very similar abilities that sort of switch positions depending on the style of route and even just mistakes. Um, so yeah, it's not. It's definitely all to play for. Yeah, tomorrow's final will be from 10 a.m. or just before 10 a.m. If you want to join us for that. That is the British senior lead, veteran lead, and paraclimbing championships. All the medals will be giving out tomorrow. So the big hitters out now into the penultimate pair, Dylan Soyan and Zoe Petermans. Zoe becoming really competitive again. Dylan, again, another young climber, still competing as a youth athlete. Very impressive to see him qualifying in second place uh, this morning. So I think he'll be pretty chuffed with that. Zoe, another favorite in the women's. Um, definitely don't discount her she knows how to try hard on a route and um, she'll be hoping for big things I reckon and will definitely be climbing quite quickly through this first section and I have no doubt she'll be feeling pretty confident
Dylan has said that his aim for this event is giving it some beans and hopefully not letting go, which I think is what most competition climbers hope for in these events, right? And when we were just talking about um, the pressure on the athletes coming out last, you alluded to the quick draw swinging. It's quite clear where the rope has been pulled down, where the previous athlete got to. I've just been watching that more and more. And I think if I was the climber out there looking up, it's, it's a fairly intimidating thing to see quick draw swinging so high up on the wall. And you know that you've got a huge battle on your hands. Yeah, I think it depends on how you look at it. I know that... Zoe backs herself 100% and probably will choose to see that quick draw swinging less of a sort of intimidation and maybe more of a okay if they can get there I can get there as well um, and see it that way and um, yeah a lot of these things are all about perspective and I think as competition climbers you're sort of taught to try and see things in the best way that's going to motivate you that might be to sort of scare yourself and be more careful on routes and try not to make mistakes but it also might be to really back yourself 100% and be like right I can do this and I can get to wherever that person before me has gotten if not higher. Fantastic insight there from Hannah Smith XGB team member winner of this competition back in a few years back now 2018 but still clearly got all the knowledge to show us what it takes to be a high level athlete as uh, Dylan just get himself snared in the rope there a little bit we saw that happen in qualifiers. One of the women actually tangled her arm and ended up falling off as a result. It's definitely something these climbers have to be aware of and consider. The rope can pull you off if you get yourself tangled. Um, so yeah, just got to manage those things while you're climbing. There's a lot to a route in a competition and yeah, that's not something you want to have to be dealing with while you're already pretty tired. It does seem to be a pretty well-established resting position there that you see Dylan using. Seen that from a number of athletes now. Zoe needs to be looking for scores of around 36 plus to get through to tomorrow morning's final. That will be starting around 9.45 tomorrow morning. Both Zoe and Dylan looking pretty relaxed, you got to say, up until this point. Pretty comfy. Really great hip flexibility there from Dylan, somehow using a right heel and a left toe as Zoe comes down. That's going to be really close. Notably not getting the plus. That could be quite a big factor in this yeah, semi-final. We will see as we get the live results update as we lose. Dylan just feet skittling around a little bit. There's not much to stand on there, just the top side of slopers for his feet. Yeah, just going back to Zoe. I don't think that's going to be enough. That's going to be really close. And if it's not, I think she'll be absolutely devastated with that. She's definitely come into this event um, hoping to win. Um, so, yeah, we've just got to wait and see, I guess. She's still got a smile on her face, though. Yeah, that's going to be really close. All, all around sort of hold 35 to 36. little shake of the head there from Zoe as we saw right in front of the cameras there it's tricky coming off the stage you're not sure exactly what you what you need and it's such a close event she is looking around now trying to find some supporters who are going to know it's so hard as a comp climber to not really know what's going on you have a rough idea but as I say she was only a plus behind everybody else so she may think she has done enough she may not be sure she may know she's not done enough but yeah to sort of look around and try and gauge what everybody's saying is quite quite difficult yeah it's not like in football you smack the ball in the net and you can just run off celebrating it's uh, a lot more nuanced than that the final climbers are out for Cameron and Joe Ormsley Joe Walmsley, another climber who's travelled a long ways from Somerset. Um, so definitely a big journey up here for him. Um, really big commitment as well. 
um, has said that his strengths in climbing are board climbing. Um, I don't think this route's very like a board, so fingers crossed for him. <laughs> yeah, board climbing, sort of five moves maximum, usually at 45 degrees on tiny bits of wood. It's quite different from what uh, what we're seeing here in front of them in Raffo, but he's obviously not bad at lead climbing, considering he's qualified first. Yeah, come through <laughs> the qualifiers in first position. Here, Cameron as well saw her at the British Bouldering Championships finals. No, Thea, really strong all-round climber. Um, obviously qualified in first, so very good lead climber. Um, topped one of her qualifying routes, got pretty high on the other. So, yeah, let's see what she can do. See if we can get someone to show us these last few moves. Yeah, the route setter's dream is always to see one climber top the route. But ultimately, the aim here is to make sure we get good separation through to the final. We are looking for that top six, and it's very close in the women's competition. Shows how similar the level is throughout the top sort of six or seven athletes. Definitely, there's not a clear cut um, set of finalists here necessarily. So yeah, exciting to watch, definitely. pushing on with good cadence through this lower section at the moment into hole 22 is this big undercut yellow volume no issues whatsoever fear Cho looking a little bit sort of stuck to a certain degree just through these orange holes just making sure he gets it 100% right foot swapping them multiple times on that hole memory just lacking a little bit of confidence not quite found his flow yet it looks like he's got plenty of power to spare. Joe, not climbing with the same sort of flow that we've seen from the other athletes, but looks absolutely fine with that at the moment. So I guess got power to spare as Fear goes for that sort of tricky little right heel hook, puts it on with a lot of confidence right round the back of that hold. Yeah, Joe looking pretty relaxed with that knee bar. Always nice to find a nice rest halfway up a route. Thea's climbed very quickly up to this point as well. She's definitely trying for a top here. Yeah, she obviously knows her endurance levels absolutely perfectly for she's decided not to really take any of the rest just absolutely powering through and it's a very big powerful move up and left now this really, is really really good close to the high point now here for fear can she win this round exactly the same position as we saw from jen and erin very very similar scores that will be enough she'll be happy with that i reckon let's see about joe Yeah, completely different root climbing style here from Joe, just sort of really snailing his way up through this section, really maximising the rests. Joe is the final climber out, and we will shortly know who is in our top six. starting to try a little bit harder here now and um, he's climbed pretty steadily up this route definitely doesn't look exhausted but yeah having to put in a good bit of effort through these moves which we've seen a few climbers find pretty tricky but look at him resting <laughs> yeah completely different style from what we've seen from the other athletes at this stage on the route this looks like he's got a particularly tricky cut loose here we saw dylan doing essentially the splits in this position here to avoid the cut loose opting to pinch with the left hand nice takes the swing really good hold from joe there trying to match but now decides the undercut method is best big fight from joe really solid effort there definitely enough to get him through to finals tomorrow which he'll be pretty happy with i imagine 
But yeah, definitely a hard last few moves on both routes. Yeah, we're a good, good sort of 10 move or so off the top of the route there. I don't think the route setters will necessarily be too unhappy about that. You know, the show is the show is one thing, but making sure you get good results is another. In the men's, it's uh, pretty pretty close as well, but um, I think we've got there with a split. And in the women's, so close. But overall, Hannah, pretty good days climbing here at Raffo for the first day of the British Championships. Yeah, certainly a long day. Um, a semi-final, a final and qualifying rounds, but yeah, really good and looking forward to tomorrow's finals. Yeah, absolutely. We will um, either be able to bring you the results straight away um, or we'll bring those up on the screen in a minute. It's been a few years since I've been here. I was here last at the European Championships and then the World Cup just before that. And I'd say, um, yeah, Rafa not disappointing and such great work from all the organisers to put on, uh, put on a really good show, a, a good show all throughout the day today. And um, I would say the athletes overall would say they've been pretty well tested. No, definitely a really good effort from the route setters, the staff here at Ratho, um, and also the many volunteers that helped this event run. Um, couldn't do it without them, really, could we? No, definitely not. A couple more cups of tea in the commentary booth would be, you know, it's just an ask. I'm just putting it out there, but we'll, we'll suffer through. And for now, it'll be for all the athletes and everybody else involved back home to bed and then back in for isolation at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Yeah, so that wall that you see in front of you there, the route setting team, they have to go back to work now. They'll be working through the night to bring down all of those all of those holds and volumes and they start fresh tomorrow morning with the finals. And there you have the scores that we have been waiting for. Top six is going to be Fia Cameron, Erin Nice, Jen Wood, Emma Futcher, Willow Petrobelli. And it does get so close around 36.5. So that's the 36 plus that we were talking about that everyone was there or there about. Zoe Peterman's, we were really unsure whether it's going to be for her, but she does drop out. So that is going to be so close. That's the exact cutoff. No, so tight to get into that final there. Actually going to count back um, with Joe. Um, but yeah, should and make for a very tight final tomorrow as well. Yeah, and you were talking about the the need for these top athletes to actually do well here to to think about the selection events as well so it's it's important for them to get good results so even semi-finals results do have sort of big consequences definitely so this event is being used as part of gb climbing selection process and um, so the top three uh, well the podium position athletes at this event uh, will be invited to gb selection next year for the international competitions of 2024 um, which is obviously the next Olympic year as well. Um, so definitely a lot to play for here. And there you see the top of the end of the men's competition. Great work from Daniel Smith and Dylan Soyan getting 40. Joe Walmsley just behind them, uh, as we saw right at the end there on 39. Diane Akhtar, 37 plus, along with Sam Butterworth, also on 37 plus. And Finley down there on 36. So the top six go through. Robert Cook just missing out this time. Really good to see Dylan and Finlay in there in the senior final while they're both still competing at youth level. That'll be really exciting to watch them and really good effort from them as well. So a fantastic day is climbing all the way through from the qualifiers today, the speed finals and then the semi-final. Do join us tomorrow at 9.45, 10 a.m. start for the final round where we have the vets, we have the seniors and we have the para climbing finals. All to be decided. Hannah, thank you so much for joining me. We look forward to getting this show back on the road tomorrow morning.